Okay, so it's uh, 7 o'clock. Uh, Council, are you guys ready? Yes, sir. All right, great. Um, so I want to welcome everyone to the November 19th uh, regular Village Council meeting. And uh, Judy, if you could do the roll call, please. Yeah, Housh. Yes. McQueen. Here. Hempling. Here. Stokes. Here. Krieger. Here. Also present are Village Manager Patty Bates, Solicitor Chris Connard, and Finance Director Colleen Harris. Okay, great. Uh, so we're going to start off with announcements. Um, I know several council members have some. Lisa, do you want to kick them off? Sure. I'd, I would like to make an announcement about Yellow Springs Giving Tuesday. Um, Giving Tuesday is actually an, a national um, event to help with nonprofits. Here in Yellow Springs, um, two dozen nonprofits have come together to coordinate a local Giving Tuesday campaign and it's held annually on the Tuesday after Thanksgiving so that's November 27th and the idea is to kick off the holiday season by rather than just shopping in the mall or things that'll end up in a landfill um, to give uh, money instead to your favorite local nonprofit um, the Yellow Springs Community Foundation um, has coordinated a really lovely uh, website that is YS, as in Yellow Springs, YSGivingTuesday.org. And on that website, when you go there, you'll see the logos for the different participating nonprofits. And then you just click on that logo. It will take you right into that site for you to donate. And um, I suppose I can show a little bit of bias to say that amongst the many wonderful nonprofit logos, you will see one for the Yellow Springs Utility Roundup. And if you've been tracking our activities, you know that the Yellow Springs uh, Utility Roundup is a new program that the village has um, to uh, round up your utility payment um, to the nearest dollar, or in the case of Giving Tuesday, consider donating a little bit more to help um, community members who are at risk of losing their utility service. So don't forget about the Yellow Springs Utility Roundup in addition to the other great nonprofits on Giving Tuesday. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Lisa. Thank uh, Marianne, did you? Yeah. Well, I'd, I'd like to thank the village crew for the work that they had to do during our ice storm mm -hmm. to keep us safe, to keep our roads safe, to keep the electricity on. Um, I'm glad I didn't have to be out there. Uh, it, it was a very, very long couple of days for them, but they did a great job. Yeah, and I, and I do want to extend off of that just to say that, um, you know, one of the things that we're really fortunate to have uh, as a village are our own utilities, which means that uh, we have a crew that's going to come out and fix things right away. Unlike uh, if we were relying on a private, we might not get that kind of priority. And I want to say related to that, uh, I think it's really important, and I see this on Facebook now, that we respect the great work and support that our crew uh, does for the village. And uh, you know, I hope that we remember that uh, you know, while we are all taxpayers and we expect good service, uh, that we also need to uh, fully respect our village team because they're working really hard for us every day. Um, any other announcements? I do have one. Um, so uh, the ice storm obviously uh, knocked out a lot of limbs all throughout the village. And the, although we don't normally pick up brush and limbs, we will be picking up the brush and limbs from the ice storm on De uh, after December the 5th. So if you have brush, limbs, things that fell during the storm, put them at your curb. Just leave them there. They will sit there until after December 5th, and then the crews will come by and get them. So take your time, get them out there. Obviously, you've got a couple of weeks, but um, we are going to offer that service because this was such an extensive event, and it's, uh, it's going to be necessary to try to help folks get the yards cleaned up. So just move those to the curb, leave them sit there. You have until December 5th to get them there, and then probably on the 6th and 7th, they'll try to do it, barring any other weather-related <laughs> emergencies that draw their attention elsewhere. But, if you put them there, we will eventually get them. They just have to be there by the 5th. Okay. Thanks, Patty. And, and I would like to thank Jordan Gray 
for stepping into the fray tonight and acting as a, our station manager because unfortunately Spencer Glazer could not be here with us tonight. All right. Make sure to get my good side, Jordan. Um, <laughs> I do have a few announcements, as always. Um, so first of all, I do want to mention that December 3rd, our next council meeting, we will be unveiling the Yellow Springs Active Transportation Plan. Uh, so we are going to have tool design group here to do a brief presentation about that and talk about our next steps. Um, if you don't already know, uh, the tree lighting ceremony is going to be uh, this Wednesday, November 21st. Uh, I know Dino's is providing uh, hot cocoa. And um, we've got uh, 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 Brittany Baum, who is opening a new business downtown. The Green Canteen is going to be providing uh, pretzel bites. So uh, get there at 6 p.m. for warm drinks and for that lighting. Um, I was also asked to announce that um, uh, businesses downtown should let the chamber know by, by d November 21st if they're participating in the uh, holiday window contest, which is going to be judged by the Arts and Culture Commission. And um, what else do I have? Uh, that, yeah, I think you can sign up. Uh, actually, you can sign up up till November 30th uh, at yschamber.org, uh, info at yschamber.org. Um, the community Thanksgiving is going to be this Thursday from 2 to 4 at the Presbyterian Church. I always cook a turkey, so make sure to look for mine because it's going to be a uh, uh, brine for two days. So <laughs> it's going to be really good. And... Um, Yes, tomorrow. I'm putting it in tomorrow, so it's going to be ready to go. And um, I think the only other thing, um, I just wanted to uh, clarify, because I know there's been a lot of discussion about the uh, Planning Commission meeting on Monday. And I want to make it clear that, uh, you know, the uh, discussion about um, how we you know, make projects that fit our village uh, is a very important one that council is thinking long and hard about with policy. And I just want to be clear that by no means do we think a project like this uh, is warehousing our elderly, to be blunt. And uh, we want to, you know, really tip our hat to the fact that Home Inc. has been working hard to propose a project that we will be evaluating more uh, completely. Um, but I strongly believe that uh, apartment buildings and rentals can be done in a way that fits our village values. And so I want to make it clear that um, uh, by no means is there any implied uh, biased against a variety of housing options. Um, and I think it's really important moving forward to understand that uh, Planning Commission and Village Council is looking very carefully at all of these projects, understanding that, you know, we've got a lot of priorities and affordable housing is a really important one. So, um, any other announcements? Judith? Uh, well, it's my last meeting. My last meeting brought all you out to say goodbye. <laughs> <I see. laughs> appreciate it. Uh, appreciate that there were so many. There are so many great candidates to replace me. Um, I felt a little bad uh, leaving early, feeling like I was being a little irresponsible. But um, but I had personal reason. I, I felt was important. And then when all of you guys came forward, I was like, <laughs> this was meant definitely meant to be. So uh, so anyway, uh, it's been great serving the community, and good luck to council and the new member. Uh, going forward. Thanks, Judith. Um, all right. So we next have the consent agenda. And actually, I think I need to pull both of them off because I have something I want to clarify for each okay. set of minutes. Um, so first of all, with the budget work session, and if any other council members, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but there was a statement at the bottom of page one that council agreed to the new cruiser and I did not remember that that was the upshot of our discussion. So I know we, you know, discussed some different options, but I, I did not remember it that way. Um, I, I, 
didn't remember it that way, though, in talking with Patty, I understood that staff was willing to go have the cruiser be still in the budget and, and the staff, staff car would have the old cruiser car. The staff car taken out, yeah. So, but I, I agree that I didn't recall council agreeing. Okay. Right. So, so I guess I'd like to, um, uh, I guess, make a motion that we modify that. I, I'd just delete that statement. That's fine because the minutes are not, they're not exact. I sort of pulled out key pieces. There was a lot of over talking. The video was difficult. Sure. Was added to it. So just taking it out, I don't think changes. Sure. I mean, we discussed it. We just didn't come to any conclusions that I remembered. So, um, okay. any, do I get a second for that? A second. Okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, so I'd like to make a motion to approve the minutes. All those in favor? Second. Oh, does any, uh, just for that one. That was the only change I had. Oh, Were there right. any other? Uh, so I'll make a motion to approve the minutes as amended. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 So then um, <coughs> for November 5th, um, there was a statement. This is the bottom of page, I'm sorry, middle of page 8. Um, and, and I see why I got confused, but this was in our discussion where, um, Kevin, you pointed out that it was important to have um, the chief and, and the village manager involved. And then we also talked about the mayor. So the statement I made was that we could not require the mayor to participate, but I did not say that we could not require the chief and the village manage, manager to participate. So, um, is that the, well, how, the, it says October, October 15th, is that, uh, that's what I just, well, that would be oh. your next to correct, oh, yeah, okay. yeah, we right. should, we should okay, fix so that it's too. it's November. It's November 5th. Yep. Okay. Um, but, but yeah, the distinction was that, um, you know, we expected, um, the chief and, uh, the village manager to be ex officio members, but that, you know, we can't require that of the mayor, but we hope that the mayor will participate as well. So, um, so I guess I'd like to make a motion. Yeah. I've got, are you going to do each correction separately? Uh, let's do them all together. Okay. On page seven, you know, a little further down than halfway, it's quoting me, policing is not about expertise, it is about values. Well, I don't believe I would have said that, and that's not, that's, and what I'm guessing, what I believe, remember talking about, it's not just about, ex, it's not just about expertise, it's also about values, something like that. Um, I did not go back to the tape and try to find exactly my wording. Okay, and then we're going to correct the date. Anything else on this set of minutes? Um, if you can, you can just move to approve them as amended, and I've, I've got it. Okay. So the record will be the changes. Great. Okay. Uh, so I'll make a motion to approve the minutes as amended. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you. Um, okay. Reviewing the agenda. Um, any changes, additions? Yes. I, I would like the option of after we discuss uh, the general fund if we haven't come to final agreement about the budget. I would like the option to nominate Judith for a one month term before the new council person steps in. The reason why I would like to do that is I'm uncomfortable having someone step in on a budget process that's been taking hours and I'm also uncomfortable telling them not to vote on it. So, okay. Okay, so that would potentially be under new business. Um, I would also, and I know we have a long meeting tonight, but there are two things that I think we have to briefly talk about. One of them is evaluations for uh, our direct reports, um, and, and that should just be very brief. And the second thing is I'd like to um, propose something about the revolving loan fund, and I will also keep that 
very brief. So those would, I guess, be under new business as well. Okay. And Kevin, you wanted to add a nomination for Mark Ewald? Yes, thank you. Um, for yeah. Energy Board, we already did this. We, I don't remember, and, and there's okay. no record. I thought we had. So we, we, we did meet uh, to discuss uh, Mark Ewalt's qualifications uh, for Energy Board. Um, he's a past member, so his past experience and work experience, I, th I think, speak for themselves. Okay. So, so we can do that um, when we report out on commissions. Okay. Okay. Thank awesome. You. I'm All just, right. I'm just trying to get it off my plate. Yeah. Because <laughs> I think right. we just missed it. Okay. Yeah. Last Thank you. Okay. Um, Let's move into petitions and communications. Marianne? Yes, we had several communications. One was from the Greene County Combined Health Board regarding uh, some uptick in HIV cases, which have apparently been resulting from infections from shared needles. And uh, to let people know that there is a uh, a needle exchange program in Greene County, and there is test free testing for HIV. Um, the, the letter that came from the Environmental Commission came, was submitted by the Environmental Commission and was sent by the village manager and actually signed by me, was sent to the Ohio EPA regarding the Vernet contamination, and that's in the packet. Uh, there was a letter from Richard Lapides in support of which home project was it? Yeah. The senior yeah. housing project. And there was a newsletter from the National Association on Mental Illness from Clark Green and Madison County. Okay, thank you. All right, so we're going to move into uh, our legislation, and the first thing on the docket is Ordinance 2018-47. Uh, Judy, we can, I guess we should read it in full. Okay. This is enacting new Chapter 607 entitled Use of Surveillance Technology of the Codified Ordinances of Yellow Springs, Ohio. Whereas surveillance technologies are being implemented by law enforcement departments across the United States that could have a significant impact on civil rights and civil liberties, and whereas Village Council has determined that it is in the best interest of the Village of Yellow Springs to require a public hearing before any such technology is acquired or used by the Village, and whereas Village Council finds it is essential to have an informed public discussion about decisions related to surveillance technology and the impact on privacy the potential of governmental intrusion into people's lives and the impact such technologies may have on civil rights and civil liberties, including those rights guaranteed by the Ohio and United States Constitutions and the First, Fourth, and Fourteenth Amendments to the United States Constitution. <coughs> And whereas Village Council finds that legally enforceable safeguards, including transparency, oversight, and accountability measures, must be in place to protect civil rights and civil liberties before surveillance technology is deployed by the village. And whereas Village Council finds that annual surveillance technology reports should be provided by village staff to Village Council for the purpose of providing information on the use of such technologies to the public, now therefore Council for the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, hereby ordains that. Section 1, a new chapter 607, entitled Use of Surveillance Technology of the Codified Ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, be enacted to read as set forth in Exhibit A, which is attached here to and incorporated herein. Section 2, this ordinance is hereby authorized under the village's home rule powers as set forth in Article 1, Section 3 of the Charter of Yellow Springs, Ohio. Necessary for the benefit of the health, safety, and welfare of the village, including the protection of an individual's privacy rights. Section 3, this ordinance shall take effect at the earliest date allowed by law. Okay. Can I get a motion, please? I move. Second. All right. So this is the second reading. So we're going to open a public hearing. And um, I saw Ellis. Yeah, yeah Ellis, do you want to say a few yeah. words? Just to be brief. To, yes, please. Hi, Ellis Jacobs. Nice to see all of you. Uh, I just got to acknowledge uh, Judith, uh, since this is her last meeting, you've done a marvelous job. Thank you for all the work you've done. It's been really exemplary. Um, so I, I want to, in relationship to this particular ordinance, I just want to thank uh, everybody that did some work on it, the, the Yellow Springs Justice Task Force, uh, particularly Steve McQueen and Bill Randolph, the village solicitor, uh, the chief, Patty, uh, who all contributed to uh, turning out an ordinance that I think is, is really well balanced and it, it accomplishes the goals that we set out to achieve here. And of course, I want to thank uh, Village Council for being interested in this and supportive of it, as you were at the last meeting where you talked about it. Uh, this ordinance provides 
really important civil liberties and civil rights protections for the people of the village. Uh, I think the need for ordinances like this is being identified all over the country. In fact, after the article about last, uh, the last meeting appeared in the Yellow Springs News, I got an email from a young attorney in New Orleans who used to live here in uh, Yellow Springs about a situation in New Orleans where people discovered that the police there had been using some surveillance technology that nobody knew about. And he created quite a scandal. With an ordinance like this in place, we will never face a situation like that. Um, by passing this, Yellow Springs will be the first municipality in the state of Ohio to pass an ordinance like this. I don't think we'll be the last. Uh, and so let me just say that I thank you for being so forward-looking uh, and for taking this important step. Thanks, Ellis. And, and uh, thank you for your work on yeah, it too, Ellis. I really appreciate that. You worked that. very hard on it as well. Sure. Uh, and I just got to say, I got to run home because some of us brine our turkeys for three days. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. You better not. Okay. My, <laughs> Stay with me. Mine got dry brine <laughs> last <laughs> night, <laughs> so. <laughs> um, Chris, do you want to add anything? I, I really, I just have a summarized it. I can answer any questions that okay. you might have. Great. Um, I just wanted to highlight, and this is not a change. I appreciate um, uh, the response to some of the comments that we made at the last meeting. When I read it through at this time, I thought I didn't have any questions. I just want to highlight with section 607.03 C8, um, where it talks about identifying the process to communicate with council that, you know, first of all, keep in mind that we have some, you know, set ways that you communicate with council, uh, which includes our meetings where we would discuss this, uh, the use of surveillance technology, as well as, you know, being able to communicate with us by email through our um, clerk. But, uh, you know, I just wanted to highlight that that's not an ambiguous thing. We always provide a lot of opportunity for public feedback. All right. Any other questions or comments from council? Questions or comments from citizens? All right. If, oh, yes, please. Dorothy. And if you don't mind stating your name. Yes, my name is Dorothy Bouquet. Do I need to give my address here? No, I don't. Uh, no, that's okay. At the commissioners, you have to do that. <laughs> I wanted to thank Elis uh, for uh, this piece of legislation. I, I love the intent of it. I do have a question, maybe because it was how it was worded in the Wise News. Uh, I know that when if there is a, a state of emergency, then uh, the police department can use surveillance technology without consulting you guys. Is that right? No. no. So it, it mentions uh, the chief, the village manager, and the council president. Okay. So you have a check and balance because an elected official is part of that decision. Got it. Perfect. That's what I wanted to hear. Thank you very much. All right. And there's a time limitation too. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? All right, if not, Judy, if you could uh, do the roll call, please. Oh, I'm sorry, Jordan. Wow. So I thought you were just moving the camera. <laughs> All right. It's not on me. Then. <laughs> um, Jordan Gray. Just uh, um, So my understanding is that there's an unmanned aerial vehicle perimeter, or, you know, that's larger than the airport north of us that covers, I think, Yellow Springs. I don't know this for sure, but I believe so. Um, and I just didn't know how, how that might be mediated or managed, and because I, th I think that there might be like this larger zone that covers Yellow Springs. I just wonder if that could be checked into. Um, I, th I think that could be a potential another overlap, like of a problem. So anyway. Okay. Well, the, you're saying there's surveillance coming from north. And well, uh, normally the, the drones and so forth that oh. get flown, um, uh, normally they have to be like within your eyesight. But I think that there's a region around here, maybe I want to say 28 kilometer range, that allows for testing and for certain cer certain machines to be run. That's beyond the si line of sight, um, and I just wondered if. If, if that's not on your radar, it might be something to look, I'll look into it too, but. Um. Yeah, I think, I want to be clear that the ordinance only is the village's use of surveillance technology. We can't control anyone else's use, but it would be good to know if there so is. So the a, limits of what the protection is for. Yeah. There might be another overlap. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Good question. Thank you. 
question. All right, thanks. Uh, any other questions or comments? Okay. Uh, Judy, roll call, please. Yes. Stokes. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Hempfling. Yes. Krieger. Yes. Housh. Yes. All right, next we have a second reading for Ordinance 2018 48. And uh, Judy, let's just do it by title only. Yes. <laughs> this is repealing sections 1042.01I, 1, 2, 3, and 4 of the codified ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting new sections 1042.01I, 1, 2, 3, and 4. I think she should have to read the whole thing. Okay. Uh, can I get a motion, please? I move. I'm second. All right. Um, who's talking about this one? Uh, I guess I am. Okay. Um, so um, currently, if you are a residential customer and you have uh, your own generation by either solar or wind, you are reimbursed for at the end of the year, at one time a year, we true it up. And if you produce more than you use, you are um, reimbursed for the um, 11 cents per kilowatt hour, uh, the power supply cost, and currently the kilowatt hour tax, which is an excise tax uh, imposed by the state on energy generation delivered to an end user. If we reimburse for the kilowatt hour tax, then we are debiting the electric fund twice for that wants to reimburse the person who hasn't paid the kilowatt hour tax and one wants to transfer it by law we have to transfer it to either the general fund or to the state depending on where the end user is located um, so if the end user is located within the municipal limits of the village then we have to move it from our electric fund where it is collected into it, we are required to transfer it into the general fund by law if the end user is outside the village, then whatever we collect from that end user goes to the state. This ordinance um, simply takes the kilowatt hour excise tax out of the mix. The uh, person who is uh, the residential user who is still generating by either solar or wind still gets reimbursed the uh, 11 cents per kilowatt hour and the power supply cost, um, just not the kilowatt hour uh, tax itself. Okay. Um, so this is a second reading, and I'm going to open the public hearing. Uh, questions or comments from council? Questions or comments from citizens? All right, if not, I will close the public hearing. And uh, Judy, if you could uh, do the roll call, please. Yes, Hempfling. Yes. Krieger. Yes. Stokes. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Housh. Yes. Okay. Uh, we have the first reading, reading of Ordinance 2018-49, and Judy, let's go ahead and read that in full. All right, this is enacting a new Chapter 290, entitled Justice System Commission of Title 8 Boards and Commissions of Part 2, Administration Code of the Codified Ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio. Whereas village officials have undertaken a review of the roles and responsibilities of the Justice System Task Force, which was created in 2016 to review and update the village justice system, and whereas it is Village Council's intent to codify its continued commitment to ongoing review and research of best practices for a fair, responsive, and forward-thinking village justice system, and whereas Village Council recognizes the importance of gathering and considering the experiences, insights, and professional opinion of those employees tasked with communicating and carrying out policy respected to enforcement and justice in the village, as well as that of qualified and committed citizens, now, therefore, Council for the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, hereby ordains that Section 1, a new Chapter 290 Justice System Commission of Title VIII Boards and Commissions of Part 2 Administration Code of the Codified Ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs is hereby enacted. To read is set forth in Exhibit A, which is attached here to and incorporated herein. Section 2, this ordinance shall take effect and be in full force at the earliest date permitted by law. Okay. Can I get a motion? I move. move. Second. All right. Uh, Judith? Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's pretty self-explanatory. I think I want to start out saying that we owe a very large thank you to our Justice System Task Force. We had our last meeting uh, this month. Uh, we kind of finished things up. People are, uh, we brought, are bringing together ideas we want to pass on to the council in terms of, you know, little unfinished business, things that we never got to that we want to, you know, as part of your goals setting in 2019, we thought would be helpful to you that's our purpose um, so a very big thank you to the Justice System Commission members uh, it was a real 
example of volunteers, you know, working really hard you know, for the village. Didn't do everything perfectly. We, we ran in, we had some difficulties and uh, struggles along the way, but I think uh, what we learned from those struggles is going to really inform and strengthen the Justice System Commission, uh, the idea of the Justice System Commission. Um, I did have uh, a couple of little edits, and I don't know, maybe we should, I, I shared them with uh, Brian, and I'm wondering if we should just include them in. They're just little, um, really, uh, around the powers and duties, just a little more detail about the diligent recommendation development and how we stay very connected in with the goals of council, and then council stays in this as uh, the commission is, uh, you know, working on its, its work. Uh, and it was something we were trying to do with the task force, and it seemed like it would be good to kind of incorporate some of that language. And that's on the... It's on here, topic. actually, yes. The, the, the first thing was just a sort of clarification, because the, we had the, the membership and procedure, the chair, um, the, the language around the chair, which said it would be elected once a year. I mean, we ended up changing our chair a little bit in the, uh, that, that didn't quite exactly meet that. So just kind of leaving a little more flexibility that, that there would be elections no less frequently than one per year, but that would kind of give a little more flexibility around that. The agenda planning, um, I think we, we changed some of the language. I'm sorry. Here we go. Let me get it's you. on the table. I, I, I don't have one. I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Oh, thank you. Yeah, sorry about that. And, um, and then on the, so that's the, so the main thing is it just gives a little more flexibility for the committee to, uh, you know, work out uh, if it needs to make any changes in leadership that it, you know, that it, it through in the, in the context of one year that it can do that without kind of violating the rule. And then the second thing is under the powers and duties, uh, on the new sheets, it's, it's A, B, and C, uh, the new language. And then I kind of screwed up and under B. So it's just talking about as part of diligent recommendation development, the commission should, and it's just a little more detail. Um, it includes, you know, the input from staff that, you know, legal and practical concerns um, are, you know, a part of the process. Um, actually, on B, we may not want to make these official changes today since you haven't had time to look at it, but under B, work to educate itself and the community, community on current village practices, uh, the effects, so this is a, a proposed new language, the effects of those practices and who is affected and to re research best practices learn about the community's concerns and priorities regarding security and justice. So it just sort of pulls in the community concerns um, into the process, kind of it details that. Um, so if council doesn't want to make those changes tonight since I got it here very late, um, we could just uh, get it in a packet for the next time. Could, could I just make two quick comments? Yeah. Um, and I'm not saying you can't change the, the membership and procedure. But um, council did um, last year or the year before go through the process of standardizing yeah. all of the commission ordinances, and this would be a change. Right. So I just want you to be aware of that. Again, I'm not saying you can't do it. Yeah, I, I thought that Brian had talked about maybe look, re looking at those things that I understand that, Brian, and I thought this might be maybe we want to hold it till, till we look at everybody, or maybe we want to, if we think it's a good change, you know. It's not life or death, whether it be. And then, and then the second thing is, um, in the uh, powers and duties, mm -hmm. um, in A, it, it it says the second sentence is all such recommendations will consider input from staff, and in your revision you say should, and I just want to point out that one is you will do it, the other is you might do it. And I'm well, not sure we, what the intent is. Maybe we is. should say will. I mean, I think shall. Will. I mean, it's expected. It, yeah, that, I mean, it's kind of the difference be between should and shall. Yeah. I know. Uh, I did want to say I talked to uh, the mayor and I talked to the chief, um, and you know, they both were very positive about <coughs> participating as a judicial member. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know how we want to handle this. Thing. Well, 
I mean, all these changes seem like positives to me. Um, but, you know, I think we do have a second reading of this. Um, I guess my thought would be that we uh, go ahead and take a vote on the ordinance, you know, in concept, and then we'll have these updated changes reflected for the next meeting. Um, so, uh, any other questions or comments from council? Yeah, questions or comments from citizens? Yes, Sean. And if you don't mind saying your name. Yeah, my name is Sean. Happy to be here. Thanks so much for a chance to speak on this issue. Um, I just uh, wanted to raise the issue of the ex officio member of um, <coughs> being the police and the mayor, particularly the police. Um, I have brought this up with Judith uh, uh, over a month ago. i uh, very strongly concerned myself, also uh, speaking on behalf of the Yellow Springs Police Accountability Coalition, um, which were largely uh, supporting the victims of police misconduct in Yellow Springs. And um, while we, we don't believe that uh, it's appropriate to have a police officer as a member of an organization that is, uh, is um, purportedly going to uh, reform the police, that's like having uh, you know somebody sit on the panel that's going to hire or fire them. It's just inappropriate. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, people, for example, who are part of our uh, Police Accountability Coalition that don't even feel comfortable in this building because the police are located here. And, you know, we give a lot of deference to the police and even more so when they're sitting right there. We, th there needs to be the ability for the Justice System Commission to meet um, aside from the police and discuss issues uh, as a civilian oversight or a civilian um, entity um, without, um, you know, the, the prosecutor uh, wing, uh, which is uh, seen in the mayor, or the chief of police. So, um, yeah, strongly calling you get, uh, to take out the, the um, membership of the police uh, chief or any police officer or even any ex um, police on the board itself and to review how the membership is going to be uh, taken up. I think there needs to be better ways to, um, you know, bring, bring people into the uh, Justice System Commission that will actually, uh, you know, take the issue of police accountability seriously. Because, you know, this is something that, that you see in a lot of other communities where the Justice System Commission or the Police Oversight Board or Police Review Board, they end up just being like a whitewash. They don't take the issue seriously or, or they, they give so much deference to the police that um, they, they end up uh, simply uh, being part of that, that, blue, um, that blue wall. And, and so, um, you know, I, I uh, invite you, Judith, to um, uh, reach out to the Yellow Springs Police Accountability Coalition and to myself uh, individually and, and talk, to, talk about these issues. Um, I, you know, I think that um, it, it's, it's inappropriate to um, put off a group, a community group in such a small community uh, that is so serious and passionate about these issues of police accountability when you're trying to set up a police uh, justice system commission, rather. Thank you. Okay, thanks. I just wanted to say, just to be clear about the role of the commission, it will not be an oversight of our police department. It is a body that will be re recommending policy to the village council. I, I'm aware of that. Yeah, well, I just wanted to make sure to clear everybody. Sure. Yeah. sure. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And that body is also going to review the proposal for a citizen review board, which is a, a separate entity. Um, so uh, with that, uh, Judy, so other let's comments. Go oh, are there other comments? Okay. Yes. I think. I'm uh, not a part of WISPAC today, but our comments are pretty similar. Um, when I saw, I mean, I've been so busy, so today is the first time I can comment on it. When I saw that you guys were kind of recommending a police officer be on the commission, I kind of went, 
because um, I had a conversation with somebody about eight months ago over that, and my response to them was, there's no way we're gonna trust your commission with a police officer on there. This town is very, very small, and um, we already have a lot of trust issues, and so I, it's not that I'm saying you can't talk to the police, so run your Sub submissions or suggestions by the police or get feedback from the police because clearly they're influenced by it but you just can't have one on the commission. Um, I talked to someone in Dayton because I was sort of trying to figure out how this goes and they said they absolutely have police on their commission. Some of their meetings are closed as well. You guys cannot have closed meetings for the most part. We, we won't trust that. We won't accept that. But one of the huge differences between them and us is they're big. They can have a lot of dissenting voices. They can really throw down with each other. We can't. We're, we're too small. People know each other. And so I just, I didn't know he was going to comment that. I just wanted to support that concept that, that you just can't have a police officer or the police chief on the commission. So. And your name and address, please. Oh, uh, my name is Athena Fannin, and I reject the idea that we should have to give addresses. Thanks. I also wanted to note the, um, we've asked the mayor, the village manager, and our chief or their representative. They will be ex officio. They will be non-voting members. And um, I did have one question for Chris. The mayor wanted to be sure, you know, that you, know, you had considered her participation. She'd like to participate, but it doesn't cause any conflicts. She had asked me to ask you that. The answer is no, it would not. Okay, any other questions or comments? Uh, my, name's, my name is William Toll, and uh, my concern is, uh, as there's other people have mentioned, uh, trust issues with the police, uh, a concern would be uh, police, uh, I didn't have a chance to speak with someone that works for the village and because uh, I wanted to quote them as saying that it's more common than you think of where police are on the take and uh, that's cause for concern with the increasing surveillance because uh, surveillance can be used against uh, people in a malicious way because those are not uh, you know those officers that are have very minimal training to become an officer so they could be a criminal and just sign up to be a cop. And then all of a sudden, uh, there you go, you got gang members uh, working for the police, you know. So that's my concern. And uh, I'm speaking about this because I've had direct experience of it. And uh, other people are aware of things that are going on that's just not right. So thank you for listening. All right, thanks. The um, world's watching. I'm, I'm glad they are because we are making a difference. And I'm, I'm just going to uh, speak a little bit about this because we should be looking at this as a village as a big win. And what's important here is not to alienate any part of the team that's working on uh, improving our justice system. So we tried to uh, have a, with the justice system task force, to remove, you know, the ex officio positions that did not work. And so one of the reasons that we're changing the format is because we realize that we all need to be at the table working through these issues. In terms of some of the concerns that have been raised, we are thinking about a citizen review board and we will review that as a potential policy initiative. But I feel very confident that our police department wants to be on board and make changes. Our village manager has been very open and council has spent a lot of time on this. So I'm gonna just say I'm in full support of the, uh, you know, the proposal that we've made. And um, with that, I think we can go ahead and take hey, a- This did not work because the police department did not come to the table as their responsibility. So that just needs to be said because I watched the whole thing. So oh. if we're gonna make it easier for them when they're not prepared to take responsibility, that's concerning. Okay, I, well, so, and again, I appreciate the comments, but we have looked at this very carefully, and this is gonna be a winning combination. So um, I just want you to think about how we are a village that needs to support all of these initiatives and work together. And 
complaints that are not constructive are not going to help us resolve these problems. But I do want everyone to continue to come to the table and help us do what we need to do to make positive change. So, I, yes, I would Marian. like to say also that the most effective way to change a system is to involve the people who are in the system in, in developing the change. Now, the trust issue is another matter. I mean, that's what we've been hearing. And that's going to have to be dealt with. But by not, not involving police officers in the system in which we are changing is doomed to fail. I agree. Um, really clear. That was not my suggestion. Actually, that wasn't my suggestion is to not involve them at all. I mean, we can envision a, a system in which they're, they're invited to the table on invitation only. And, and that then they can, they can be briefed on, on changes, um, but then they, they leave the room. And then the decisions uh, on how to gov best govern them are then made by a civilian government. Okay. Thanks, Sean. And, you know, it's really not appropriate to keep on coming up to the mic. You got to be respectful of the fact that we've got uh, many items on our agenda, many priorities, and you already stated your opinion. It's also not uh, appropriate for you to suggest that our complaints are, are not uh, we are constructive. We're not suggesting it, but we're probably going to be here till 11 o'clock. You, you did just we say, you know, no, no, no um, uh, complaints that are unconstructive. I mean, that, that, that's not appropriate. Okay, so with that, um, can we take a vote, please? Yes, Maybe? Hempfling. Yes. Krieger? Yes. Stokes? Yes. McQueen? Yes. Housh? Yes. Okay. Uh, so we are now going to move into uh, resolution 2018-41. And uh, Judy, if you could read that in full, please. Okay. This is approving the Yellow Springs Arts Council request for a placement of a permanent sculpture on village property and establishing conditions. Whereas Wheeling Gaunt has been chosen by a diverse set of leading Yellow Springs community organizations to be remembered with a life-size bronze sculpture of his likeness as a reminder of his spirit and a tribute to his significant contributions to the AME Church, Wilberforce, and an early and integral member of the Yellow Springs community. And whereas the village of Yellow Springs has a vibrant, active, and talented artistic community dedicated to the production of original pieces across all artistic mediums. And whereas Yellow Springs Arts Council has requested permission to place the completed sculpture at Hilderon Park. And whereas Yellow Springs Arts Council has agreed to accept all responsibility for the care and maintenance of the sculpture. Now, therefore, Council for the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, hereby resolves that. Section 1, Yellow Springs Arts Council shall, in cooperation and consultation with the Yellow Springs Village Manager, place the aforementioned Wheel and Gaunt sculpture at Hilderon Park in the location agreed upon by the Arts Council and Village Council. Section 2, Yellow Springs Arts Council shall be wholly responsible for the care and maintenance of the sculpture. Section 3, any future desire on the part of either Village Council or the Arts Council to alter, remove, or move the sculpture shall be enacted in cooperation with Village Council, the Village Manager, and the Arts Council. Okay. Can I get a motion, please? I move. Second. Second. All right. Lisa, do you want to talk a little bit about this? Um, yes. Uh, we're very excited that uh, this project is coming to fruition. It's a, a very large project that starts with a life-size sculpture, um, and there's also a mural planned. Um, I know that Cheryl Durgens is here um, in the audience, who's really an expert on what's going on. So Cheryl, I'd like to invite you if you'd like to make a few comments about the project. Um, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm Cheryl Durgens. I just wanted to say um, that Willing Gaunt in many ways embodies a lot of what um, I would say would be pers uh, perseverance and strength. I think um, as a former enslaved man coming to Yellow Springs um, in the late 1800s, um, he really did um, bring a level of um, diversity to the community like well before um, we, I mean, we're, to be quite frank, we've lost a lot of diversity. Let me just be real about it. A um, hundred, over a hundred years ago, there were a wave of families that came in that were um, of African and African-American descent to this community. And it would be, um, I think, a disservice for the community not to honor and acknowledge that. And that's pretty much all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Thanks. 
Um, any questions or comments from council? It's exciting. It is Thank really you. exciting. Thank you for all the work you've been doing on this. Yeah, and I, I do want to highlight, you know, some other aspects of this that, you know, I think are good to get on the record. One of those being that, you know, there's a mural aspect to this that we want to make a, you know, really cool community engagement uh, opportunity. And the other thing is, you know, we've been talking about how to make that whole area a really nice trailhead. You know, it's right there mm -hmm. on the, um, uh, what, south side mm -hmm. of the train station. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's some really important opportunities there that are going to make that a great place. Bike trails on the south. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thought we were. I thought we were going to be on the south side. No, the west. Yeah. West yeah. south. We're going to be. It's a south. confusing triangular park. Right. <laughs> We've had this be, conversation we're be, before. We're going to be south towards. South we're going to be towards Xenia. Yeah. So uh. yeah. So. Uh, I was going to say, uh, I I'm really pleased about this. Uh, project because I think it is so important that these early powerful leaders of our community are, are um, visible, you know, in, and how important it is for our young people. Um, I think it's very important. I think it's wonderful. I'm really uh, appreciate everybody that's been involved with it. Okay. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And I forgot to make one announcement, and the mention of Wheeling Gaunt uh, reminded me oh. that the flour and sugar delivery started today. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a very long list. It will probably take the crews the next two days to get through that, but it, the deliveries did start today. All right. Um, and is there still an opportunity if you're not on the list to get um, on the list? You can give me a call, and I will see what I can do. Um, Ruth Ann is out this week on vacation so if you call the office please leave a message i am checking the messages i will call you back all right okay um wheeling gaunt um bequeathed um the property which is now gaunt park to the village um with not necessarily for a park uh, but with the disclaimer that the proceeds from that land should provide uh, an annual flour and sugar donation to the widows and orphans was the way that it was worded in the village. Um, so we do include widows and widowers at this point. Um, and so they get a bag of flour and a bag of sugar once a year that is delivered by our electric crew. Um, we buy it from Tom's Market. Um, they picked it up this afternoon and started the deliveries around town. So if you want to be on that list, please give me a call. And if you see the guys out knocking on doors and carrying bags of flour and sugar <laughs> around, that's what it's about. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. Um, all right. So next on the agenda is citizen concerns. And this is the a time in our meeting when uh, we invite any comments for items that are not on the agenda. Uh, we ask that you limit your comments to three minutes and uh, also be mindful of the fact that we have probably two and a half more hours of meeting time uh, ahead of us. So please be respectful of that. So do we have any citizen concerns? Oh, here, I passed this down. Oh, oh, we you have, have some list. names? Yeah. All right. Um, yeah. And please state your name. Okay, and, sure. uh, and um, Yeah, I'm Patrick Lake. Um, on the issue of trust with law enforcement and the residents of town, I just have a suggestion. Something that we could do to address it would be within a reasonable amount of time, any full-time law enforcement officer must establish residency in the village. I think if we can see our officers at the grocery store or in town, that can be something that can be repaired. I'm sure there are other issues that need to be addressed around that suggestion, but just something to think about. Mm -hmm. Okay. And thanks for that suggestion. I will say legally we cannot require that, but the council has talked about possibly incentivizing uh, living in the village, and so that is something that, that we will continue to think about. Um, and so, okay, Kevin, I got you on the list. Magruder? My name is Kevin Magruder, and I am on the board of Yellow Springs Home Inc., where I serve as treasurer, and I'm also a member of the Village Managers Housing Advisory Board. I've worked in the area of affordable housing since I graduated from college in 1979. 
Until this year, Yellow Springs Home Inc. developed single family homes, one home at a time. But in this, our 20th anniversary year, we are committed to increasing the scale of our development in order to better meet the demand for housing affordable to low and moderate income families in Yellow Springs. We currently are constructing Forest Village homes, six rental apartments on two Dayton Street sites. The Glen Cottages development, for which we are requesting funding of $60,000 over two years from the village, will be a development at Xenia Avenue and Woodrow Street of 12 small homes for rent and for sale that will be built in phases. This development represents the next step in our work. Yellow Springs Home Inc. is a community development corporation, one of hundreds of similar community-based nonprofit organizations that since the late 1960s have developed housing for low and moderate income people that most for-profit developers do not build for because it is not sufficiently profitable. We appreciate the pocket neighborhood development and the planned unit development zoning changes that council has made to encourage more dense development in some areas of the village, which will reduce the cost of developing housing. We also appreciate the assistance that the village has provided Home Inc. homes from waiving tap fees for utilities to providing land on Cemetery Street for the development of several new homes. While the bulk of the financing for Glen Cottages will come from individual donors, the Federal Home Loan Bank, of Cincinnati and other sources, these donors are interested and will be inspired to provide future funding by evidence of local funding commitments. Our request to the village would match the commitment made by the Yellow Springs Community Foundation. We believe the funds would also demonstrate that the village is prepared to provide a modest financial commitment as an additional means of helping to achieve the village goal of encouraging the development of housing that is affordable to low and moderate income people. As you know, Yellow Springs is unusual. In a rural region, we are a village that has long had a commitment to social justice and racial and economic diversity. Most community development corporations are in urban areas where a wider range of foundations, large municipal budgets, and the potential for a variety of development opportunities can better support their work. The uniqueness of Yellow Springs has made it possible for us to have Yellow Springs Home Inc. here, a community development corporation that can assist the village to demonstrate that housing can be built for low and moderate income families in a village of relatively high incomes and in a real estate market that is very desirable. This housing will enable more people who work in the village to also live here and will attract young families to village schools. This work can be a model for other communities facing similar challenges across the country. Your consideration is appreciated. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, Susan, yes. <clears throat> I'm Susan Stiles, and I wasn't sure if this was the appropriate time because I'm about the affordable housing fund. Um, so actually, if it is about the affordable housing yeah, fund, then to wait. you should wait. Great. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, do we have any other? Yes. Uh, Dorothy, I'll take you next, and uh, if you could... Hi, my name is Corey White. Yep. I'm a member of the Yellow Springs Police Accountability Coalition. We uh, drafted this letter to read, if that's all right. No, it's not too long. Okay. Dear Yellow Springs Village Council, please consider the following draft resolution for adoption before the end of the year regarding the annual Yellow Springs New Year's ball drop. Whereas an incident of police excessive use of force and general misconduct following the annual Yellow Springs New Year's Eve ball drop, bringing in the year 2017, resulted in around 300 villagers attending the first council meeting in the new year and the national news covering the incident. Whereas the police had removed the protective police barricade from both sides of the State Route 68 within 15 minutes after midnight, while hundreds of citizens were still surrounding the recently lowered disco ball exposing the crowd to oncoming traffic during a night and time notorious for drunk driving. Whereas police pushed their vehicle into the crowd without making an order to disperse despite numerous requests made from the multiple citizens independent from each other to make a public announcement to disperse the crowd or turn off the sirens and lights and allow the annual event to continue. Whereas despite generalized discontent from the mostly white crowd Police singled out and body slammed a non-white citizen in a predominantly white community, whereas a police officer fired a taser into the crowd as a means of crowd control, while the crowd successfully pried the body slammed victim from the attacking officer. 
whereas the New York Times coverage of the incident published 5th of February 2017 entitled A Small Ohio Town Clamors to Curb Aggressive Policing identified subtle differences in perspective. White residents were complaining largely about the officer's violation of social norms in a laid-back town, while black residents focused on what they saw as a racially biased force that targeted them regularly, whereas the Village Council responses to the incident so far have not included anything which would actually prevent the incident from happening again. For example, taser guidelines were violated during the incident, so passing further taser policies does not resolve that issue. Implicit bias training do not amount to prohibiting conduct. The social worker appointed since the incident has identified the real problem with local policing is finding ways to remove bad apples from the onlookers of police conduct. Just because the chief of police is new doesn't mean similar mistakes might not be made in the future. Note, several of these proposals were already being considered before New Year's Eve 2017 by the Justice System Task Force, which was created after Paul Shank was shot and killed in his home by police after calling them for help. Be it therefore resolved, Yellow Springs police are, from this point forward, not to remove citizens and the event safely barricades from the streets after the annual YS New Year's Eve ball drop before 1 a.m. Unless, in the case of an imminent emergency or imminent threat to life or in in injury, and if any crowd remains after 1 a.m., the police are to be courteous in their request to vacate the area. Be it furthermore resolved, as in historic condition custom, police are to exercise their discretionary authority by intentionally not enforcing laws or restricting public consumption of and public intoxication from alcohol by adults 21 years or older for the first hour of each new year with the security barricade around the New York, Yellow Springs New Year's Eve ball drop event, so long as the individual does not pose a serious risk to themselves, to property, or other people present. Thank you. Thanks, Corey. Uh, any other citizen? Yeah, uh, I'm sorry, Dorothy, you're next. Yes. Hi, Dorothy Bouquet. Um, so my question was, was really to uh, follow up with what Patrick asked you and you mentioned that you, the council, will be discussing incentives to have uh, law enforcement officers staying in the village. What's the procedure here? Are you working with a commission? Is it something that is internal? Uh, what I meant is that it's an issue that's been brought up yeah. that I would expect that our justice system commission will look into. So the justice system commission should make recommendations and then they will go through the motions that way. So if we want to work on this, we work with the Justice Commission or we reach out to you? Uh, yeah, the Justice System Commission, which we will be um, uh, forming by January. So so we'll okay. be sending out a call for membership and, and all of that, so. Did you hear of it? Yeah. Okay, thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. I think it might be February. <laughs> okay, it's or February. It's gonna take a little time. Well, we'll, we'll <laughs> at least put the call out by January. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Um, yes, Athena? <clears throat> yeah, and I'll just say, I think it's a great idea. We just, we have to figure out if it's a possibility. Yeah. Athena Fannin, last week I came and I talked to you about the uh, RV ordinance. And um, I want to thank you guys. That was a very unclear situation. And you guys, that somebody vulnerable was already starting to get caught up in that. And um, you guys clarified that pretty quickly, or somehow through the system that got clarified for the police. So um, on, on those people's behalf, and on the behalf of everybody affected by those policies, I really, really want to thank you guys for that clarification. Um, yeah, I think my final comment is, is, is this situation demonstrates how much power and how much you guys influence day-to-day -day lives. So. I'm grateful. Thanks, Athena. And I think that's a very good point. Um, any other comments? Sean? So, <clears throat> um, thank you. I'd just uh, like to invite you uh, to respond to the proposed resolution. Um, we got it today. So it will be in our packet for the next meeting. And I think that would be an opportunity for us to comment more on it. So, um, does that mean it would be an agenda item on the next? I'm not going to guarantee that, but it'll be in the packet. So, it might be an agenda item. 
Um, <laughs> I, 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 we, I'm, I'm thinking about this meeting right now. So thanks, Sean. Well, we, we, we look forward to you, you seriously considering it as an agenda item. Honestly, a lot of people from the community really cared about this issue two years ago. Um, New Year's Eve is coming up, and so please do consider uh, really, you know, taking this, this seriously. Uh, it, it, you know, we've, we've elected all of you um, to take our concerns seriously, and, um, you know, we, we hope that you, you take that to heart. Um, now, I also want to invite uh, Judith uh, to, you know, as your last, last time here, to apologize to me regarding um, having spread uh, inaccurate information about me that you got from the chief of police. I'm just going to comment that that's, that's inappropriate. No one knows what, what the content of that is. It's not appropriate to call out a cancel council member. I'm going to have to ask you not to make that request and please sit down. I'm sorry. Are you saying that I don't get to finish my uh, three minutes? You can't have a back and forth exchange with a council member concerning a situation about which no one knows anything. Well, I'll, let me just take the, the rest of my time to, to, to say exactly what it was. Okay, I, I was raped by a member John, of the... John, you have said, you, probably everyone in Yellow Springs knows this. You have said this over and over. It, it was a very unfortunate thing, but we don't want to hear it again. I will uh, re remember that you said you don't want to hear it again, but you know what? I don't want to talk about it ever, okay? I don't ever want to talk about this, but I don't want this to ever happen to anybody in this town again. And that's why I talk about it, because I care about the protection of children, the safety of children. So Sean, if you and, were and, and the fact down, that you would say, okay, so I don't want to hear it ever again, five, think about so that. If we, don't, if we don't talk about it, these issues back. of how our police so are handling the issues of sexual yeah. abuse, then we are ensuring that they will, our, our elected officials will mm -hmm. be complicit. Okay, uh, do we have any other citizen concerns? Okay, if not, we're going to move into uh, special reports, and so this is uh, <clears throat> kind of wrapping up things with the budget, and uh, is Colleen back yet? Um, she was in the hall. Okay. <laughs> um, and <clears throat> well, I'll just wait for Colleen to come back. Yeah, hey, Colleen. Well, so <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so, uh, Colleen, I, I'll just kind of preface by saying. Uh, and to council as well. I think the best way for us to use our budget time is to just uh, target some of the key areas where um, we've got you know some things to still wrap up, and uh, so we don't need to do a you know big overview. And um, I am good with Marianne since you did such a nice job of uh, uh, outlining some of your. Uh, items. Maybe we could just start with some of those. Yeah. Can I oh, take, yes. Can we have just a brief? D Colleen gave everyone sure. this handout, and just in our conversations over the last um, month or six weeks, it's become it's it's, be, it's become um, evident to us that some some people understand the difference between funds and appropriated funds and some don't, and these conversations aren't, it's not just council member, it's citizens, and I think just a brief explanation of funds versus appropriated funds. Because if you, you need to understand that once you put, an, uh, uh, you appropriate a, uh, an amount of funding to a particular item in the budget, whether that item be uh, electric supplies or um, affordable housing or revolving loan fund, that money is appropriated to that line and cannot be used for anything else. And the rest of the money that's sitting over here in your fund balance is what's available for um, last minute items that come up. So essentially, if you think of it, Colleen, if you want to explain your checkbook 
theory. Okay, um, that and, might be a. <laughs> and Patty did a really good idea. So this, will, I'll keep this real brief. In, in the content of financial reporting, the term fund balance is used to describe the net position of governmental funds, um, similar to your checkbook or savings balance. We record all the revenue that we spend in every fund and we record all the expenditures. And the balance reflects what's still available in each fund. When we appropriate is what we're working on with this budget. The appropriation is an act of setting aside money for a specific purpose. So as we go through the budget and we um, estimate from history and from known items to uh, the best of our ability, the appropriations are what we're asking for to set aside to be able to spend with your approval of the budget. Money not spent in this budget is, stays in the fund balance, it stays in basically the savings or checking account. Um, the budget, I always consider a not to exceed, so I try to keep the cap in there that I project I will need in all the funds and all the expense items for 2019. If I go over or something is inappropriate that we didn't realize, then we come back with a supplemental and explain what and why. So basically, we don't want to tie up all the fund balance on appropriations unless we know we're going to use it. Because then at the end of the year, I have to put that money back. I have to go back to the county and say, we, we didn't need this much. We have to put it back. And then that makes it available for another purpose. And again, for anything that we don't have resolved right now, because we really are getting down to the wire on getting the basic budget approved, we can add in the first of the year. We can come in with council and say, okay, now we want to have this amount of money out of our fund balance to work on this project. So it's not that it can't happen next year, but if it's not kind of specific and clarified within the, this allotted time, we need to at least get the regular operating budget um, approved. So I'm, I want to answer any questions and make any changes that we can do knowing that some of it might have to go into next year. Okay. Fund balance and appropriation. <coughs> Sorry, that got a little lengthy again. No, that was, that was good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, okay. okay. So kick it off, Mary Ann. Yes. So, so I had five budget requests. <coughs> the planning commission request is in the budget, so the 30000 for yes. the comprehensive plan. Mm -hmm. I understand that the uh, 2500 that I was requesting for the glass farm management could come out of the commission fund. Mm -hmm. so that, that's cool. So that leaves the, um, no, there were, I guess, four, four requests. The other two requests deal with housing. Now it gets complicated because I know there's also a, um, an agenda item to start an affordable housing line in the budget, uh, which I don't think we're ready for, but that's, I, I need to just set that aside. The two other requests that I have are that we, uh, in this year's budget, include 30000 for the Glen Cottage development, and that we also commit to do that in 2020 and whether that comes out of an affordable housing fund or whether that comes out of the uh, incentive line item that has $81,550 uh, I'm not whatever we you you advise whatever council decides uh, I'm cool with that but what I do think is important is that we not just say we're going to put money toward affordable housing and not say what's going to happen with that money or say, well, we'll decide what's going to happen with that money. Because um, the analogy I've been thinking about is that phrase, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Uh, if you have something, it's better than something that might be out there somewhere in some bush. Well, in this case, there are no birds in the bush. <laughs> we have one affordable housing project, which is the Glen Cottage, that has come to us and it's taken years to acquire the property, to develop the concept and get it in place where it can go for funding. If 
If there were another affordable housing project that we might choose from, we would know it. And, and there's only one affordable housing organization in Yellow Springs. We have Green Met Housing, but they are not, I guess they don't have any money, but for whatever reason, they're not doing anything. Habitat for Humanity won't touch Yellow Springs because the uh, properties the property costs too much. So we have one project. We have one opportunity to spend this money. And I think it's much more appropriate to say this is what the money's going to go for than to say, well, we'll look around and figure out what's going on. The other thing is the glass farm pre-development study that we, I don't, we frankly don't know how much it's going to cost. So that's more in line with what you were saying. I suggested 20000 because I was looking at, since we're not funding the green space, it was 50000 put 30000 toward the Glen Cottage development project and twenty for the glass farm. I don't think it's appropriate to put to take twenty thousand out of an affordable housing fund for the glass farm. I think that's really misappropriating those funds because the glass farm is a mixed income development. And I would think that once we get to the point where we start developing the glass fund, that it will be a special line item, a special project, and if we spend money now on it in this uh, study, that that would get reimbursed at some point when we account, when we'd sell the property to one or more developers. So um, those are the two things. And I, uh, I, whatever you say, whatever you, however you think it's best to put in the budget, I'm cool with. I just think it needs and I think Something Patty and I can have a conversation so she can also give me history of these projects and we have money in the economic development fund well, yeah. or we might have to be waiting to create the new fund that we're talking about. If, if in fact, the, the um, geotechnical report for the glass farm, um, the expansion of that were not to come out of the affordable housing line, it would have to come out of professional services line either council's professional services line or my administration professional services line, which would require an additional appropriation of probably the 20000 to do that. I mean, it, it, it is a professional service. That's where we took it from when we did the original uh, core drillings to find the water table. Um, so it can clearly fall under that. And, um, and the Housing Advisory Board is recommending the council approve this not, not just more soil borings, but uh, a detailed um, study of... Um, Hydrological study. Well, no, a civil, have a civil engineer, have a civil engineering firm look at the site, request any needed soil borings, any other geotechnical hydrological studies that need to be done, so that then they can say, these are the areas where there could be houses, these are the areas where the utility should be. These are the areas for the stormwater retention. And also study, if we were to do apartments on that site, what would have to be done in order to do that? We have to look at the trade-off. Is it worth it to put bigger buildings on that site, given that it might need more work to support those buildings? So uh, let me propose, first of all, the ones that I think are easy. Um, so I think the glass farm management, uh, you know, group, yeah, um, I would like that to come out of the commission budget yes, that's, and, that's cool. you know, cause that is a subset of, uh, environmental commission. Um, and then I have mentioned before that I thought the update of the comp plan should come out of our economic development fund. Um, that to me seems, you know, directly in line with, um, it's you know what we're doing there. I think you have it separate. It's under the general fund in the planning and zoning, the 30000 for the uh -huh. comprehensive So I, I guess I want us to consider that that's a, a good investment of our economic development fund. Um, so, I mean, I definitely agree that it, it's something that we need to do, um, and I think that's a logical place to attribute it to, but I don't know if there are other thoughts, Judith. Just in terms of process, we're talking about now two or three different things. 
And I feel like we should get all the proposals, I know Lisa's got one, uh, you know, for, uh, that we get them all on the table, we know what they are, and then that people make a motion, and then they, people speak to it. And in terms of, I was gonna say, on sort of a practical question, what fund it comes out of and so on, I mean, if it's coming out of an already established fund, um, that's something to talk about. But this thing about where would the money, if, if we go ahead and do the funding for the homing project, where that comes from, I think is a discussion we don't need to have here. Staff needs to recommend to staff, uh, council, where we come from. But I, like, I was thinking, why don't we, rather than getting into discussions about particular proposals that Mary Ann's made, let's get all the proposals on the table first and then make motions and discuss each one separately. Some of them may not need much discussion at all, but I just think we need to take a vote. We should take a vote. We shouldn't just each be saying we're for this or we're not for this or whatever. I think it will be cleaner. Does that make sense? Um, I'm okay with that. I mean, I, to me, I think some of the ones that we were all in agreement on, I'd like to get out of the way. But but it, but that's it's, fine. But, it's, but, I but it's fine. Should, shouldn't we do a vote though, rather than oh sure saying, sure. You know, I mean. But, uh, but I'm okay with uh, uh, putting other things on the table that are out there. So, um, Lisa, you were referenced. Yeah, um, I have provided an updated request for the professional services budget for the police department organizational assessment. Mm -hmm. And I'm not seeing it in the packet. Yeah, it was in it was. the budget packet. Oh, it's in that budget packet? Yeah. Okay, so I don't know why I didn't see it. So I made um, revisions to that after conversations with the council to clarify. Um, uh, Judith had concerns that this was somehow a competitive move um, as an alternate to the um, Justice Commission. Um, that was some concern. I want to reinforce this is absolutely not an instead of um, request for either the commission or for the previously um, uh, made proposal that I brought for a citizen advisory group. This is a, a totally um, separate proposal for um, a potential up to $30,000. I don't know what the consulting costs might be for something like this, but the way the process uh, kind of unfolded is when we had the um, separate meeting to look at budget. Um, Patty sent out a request and said, if anybody has uh, an additional request for budget that you might anticipate, like this is the time to do it. So um, this was pulled together um, quite quickly and then has been expanded to add clarity. Um, I worked on this proposal with Marianne. Uh, and the idea is, I think tonight maybe reinforced even the need um, to have some outside professional support uh, to do an assessment of what's going on with policing, both around resources, to have greater confidence that the police department budget is right-sized, um, to have uh, some look at policies, procedures, and practices around hiring, development, and day-to-day -day activities of the police department to look at the police department effectiveness and alignment with guidelines for village policy, uh, related guidelines with policing. So for example, changing the policing culture and examining the extent to which the police are functioning in line with the guidelines, values, and policies that have been developed in the village um, to, to uh, step into some impactful police community engagement uh, to develop more positive relationships and trust between the villagers and the YSPD. And this is something that's come up in today's meeting already um, a number of times. So my intention of bringing this proposal was to earmark some money that would be there at some point in the year once the uh, commission and the council decide that this may or may not be necess necessary. Uh, when we developed it, we did not intend it to define the specifics of a consulting proposal, but instead just to make the case for a budget set aside in anticipation of work later in 2019. Of course, council would want to be very clear about the purposes of engaging um, professional services, 
Um, I amended the document with Mary Ann to say that the Justice System Commission would be likely to take the lead on this work and um, that both the council as well as the PD would be involved in the selection and planning process for this work. So that's why this is in here. Okay. Um, are there any other proposals that we should mention? Um, I just have a few things, but I, I guess this is where I think, I mean, some of these are really just clarification. So there's um, the legal fees that I know there were some changes on. Um, so I guess what I can specifically say to that is uh, my proposal there is that we budget for our retainer, uh, which uh, totals 57000 a year. And we also budget for, and I saw this reflected, an additional 30000 for um, other legal things that come up. And my understanding was, Colleen, the, the number that we had budgeted was before was 171000 uh, I believe. And we took it out of the police department actually had their own legal um, expense line and several little amounts in some of the other enterprise mm -hmm. funds. Okay. So now they are just in the three. The new one is the mayor, yep. 15000 in case you get a prosecutor for court, and that can be later in the year. Then. The 60000 in the manager's budget for the retainer. The retainer, and then 30000 in councils for any above that would be approved. It, we, we, <coughs> Colleen and I discussed it, and we thought that would be a really clear way to keep it separated um, because anything that's outside the retainer would then be a discussion with uh, the president of council to determine that it, something could be outside the retainer. Or, as we've talked about, as we have special projects, right. we need to think about the legal budget for that as well. So, I mean, ultimately this means cutting the legal services budget almost in half, mm -hmm. which I think is, it's really important for us to be more, to monitor this carefully. And then remember, we have different options, like PEP mm -hmm. is a possibility. Um, what does PEP stand uh, for? PEP stands for the Public Entities Pool. It's our, uh, our liability insurance company. And if uh, something proceeds to litigation, <coughs> excuse me, it gets referred to PEP and there's a $5,000 deductible um, and you're done. It's not a continuing uh, legal fee. So, you know, we could start to make decisions about how we keep ourselves within that budget um, as things come up or hopefully not. I mean, I know you mentioned uh, to me that the expectation of Chris being here at every meeting, that actually expectations of Chris are going to change because, of course, you know, for cutting budget, we don't expect him to be here as, as available as he has been. And, um, yeah. and then the second thing I, w I did want to say is I think there is a, it is important that in the retainer is the ability for every council member, obviously we, should, you know, we shouldn't be calling him all the time, but there's any kind of... That's something that when I first came on the council, it was made clear to me that there does need to be the ability, though I think you know maybe uh, contacting our president to say, I've got a question here, um, that there is an ability for council to get the legal advice because we are held equally responsible, uh, that we can do that. And, and so that would be, I would like to see that to be part of in the retainer, you know, that Right. And, and Patty also, you know, when she referred to council president, I mean, the idea there was if there was an emergency that, you know, we have a process for that. But my expectation is that we should be able to talk about any, you know, additional legal fees uh, before we make those decisions. Um, but I do want to reiterate that fairness is important here. And I know how many hours you guys put in, Chris, and mm -hmm. we want to balance that as well, right? So we want to think about, I mean, I think the first thing is we got to tackle budget, right? And then we can, you know, work out some of the issues about what the retainer, how that uh, transitions. If, if, um, if I yes, one thing sure. Point, uh, I, I think that the, the discussions that we've had, that we can certainly manage the, the legal side of things uh, through a project management system that, that we've discussed. And I think that that will 
I hope at a couple different levels. One, because then it, it will help council manage its agenda as well because there's a financial implication to that. Sometimes I think we've charged forward with an aggressive agenda and we kind of get down a path and things go fast. And uh, So I think it's a good thing. Yep. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. The other thing that strikes me is that there are, we're going to legal counsel around, enter, around our utility, uh, utilities frequently enough, are we not? And I'm not sure, was that coming out of utility budgets or was it coming out of- I'm uh, sorry, I, I, I don't understand. You know, if there's, if there's, you know, when we're doing contracts, say, say electric contracts, mm -hmm. are those coming those, out of our, were they coming out of Are you talking about the power contracts? The I'm just saying, you know, when we have to involve our, our legal it, counsel on if there, an issue like electric, uh, or electricity uh, if contracts. Well, it depends on the issue. If, there, if you're talking about the power contracts that we have with AMP, those are done. Chris may review those, but we I'm haven't sure signed. Oh, okay. Yeah, that they're normally specialized. Okay. Um, the solar array, when we did the solar array contract with AEP, that we hired a, a, another firm because it's a specialized Thing. So that would have come out of the 30000 So. So then the second, I guess, proposal um, <coughs> came out of our discussion about right-sizing our funds, uh, particularly with the electric fund. Mm -hmm. And again, that was reflected in the new documents. So I appreciate that there was some good thought around that. Um, the main thing being, and Judith mentioned this a while back, and I think it's a really important point that um, you know, when we think about how we operate as a government, we're not, we don't want to be sitting on funds, you know, forever, right? We want to spend current taxpayer dollars on current projects. And so to that point, um, I asked, you know, based on what Colleen told us about that fund meeting, 1.5-ish million, that the additional 1.1 million should be either put into a capital improvement fund if we're gonna be doing those projects in the next five years, um, or you know, we had potentially talked about other things like softening the blow on the general fund by you know, taking the full cost of the Bobcat and that sort of thing out of that. Um, and Colleen, maybe you can just tell us what you guys ended up proposing in this budget to reallocate that. For the fund balances on the enterprise accounts, the water, sewer, and electric, we did keep it a little over our four-month minimum, and the rest we moved into the capital funds that associate with the enterprise fund. So the electric enterprise funds balance is moving into the electric capital improvement, and mm -hmm. so is water and so is sewer. It, so that will stay in there for those future projects without making transfers. And, and I do just want to reiterate that before we bring the final budget back to council, I do want to do one last check with Johnny Burns, um, the public works superintendent, to make sure that he is comfortable with moving all of those over there. I don't see why he wouldn't be, but you know, there may, he may want to, instead of moving a million over, he may want to move 750,000 or 850,000, just you know, in case something catastrophic happens because the thing you have to remember is once you move it to the capital fund you cannot move it back to the operating fund once it's there it's there so if something mm. happens and you don't have the money in the operating fund it has to come from somewhere else so always keep I that in mind about that. yeah I mean because you can't you can move it over to the capital but you can't move it from the capital back to the operating thank you that's a really important clarification because I've been very pro having that the money set aside in the capital fund <clears throat> primarily because I think that without it being allocated that way it sends a, a false sense of um, wealth if you will when we know that we have these really major capital expenses coming up mm -hmm. but that's a really important point thank you yeah. And, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't move some of those balances over there mm -hmm. and I'm certainly not saying that we don't have projects that we can allocate them to. Right. I'm just saying just keep that in mind when we're making these transfers from operating to capital that it can't come back. It's like you can move from general fund to anywhere else but you cannot move out of the enterprise into the general fund. It's the similar thing. Mm -hmm. If you move it into capital, it's in capital. Right, which is why we have 
you know, I think we're already conservative about our budget balances. So, uh, so then the other thing that I want to make sure in that final iteration is that we are also thinking about this sort of current taxpayer dollars being spent on current capital projects that are going to benefit our citizens uh, right now. So, you know, to that degree, you know, we talked about the buyout of the solar field, which is 10 years down the line. I think it's great to know that that's on our radar, but you know, we do need to keep in mind that there is profit that comes back into the fund, you know, and that is budgeted for for future maintenance. So I just want to make sure we're you know thinking about that balance. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so the affordable housing fund, I'll hold off on that because I think that's a different discussion. And then the last thing I wanted to reiterate is I'll just put it under the theme of having skin in the game. And we identified a couple um, uh, maintenance needs where, um, you know, I think to justify our support, uh, we need those organizations to also um, be involved in supporting that. One of those is John Bryan Community Pottery, where we're looking at 36500 over the next two years. And uh, so what we have put forward is um, putting in the budget that half of that will come through some kind of revenue. So whether they are doing a capital campaign or they're looking for donors to keep that space. Otherwise, I think to be responsible, we need to think about um, potentially repurposing that space. Um, I think we do want to take care of all of our buildings, but we also have to be responsible around that. Can I ask you yes. then about that? Um, what, what are you proposing in terms of our relationship with them? So I talked to Roger Reynolds, uh, who's on the board, um, and I think they, the impression I got was that they understood um, you know, where we're coming from because we do have a very tight budget and, you know, again, it would be great if we could support, you know, the Yellow Springs Arts Council with their rent, you know, over on Quarry Street and that sort of thing, but we've got to balance that. So I think they understand that and um, they're going to be talking internally about what they can do. Um, the other one that I thought uh, we needed to think about are the ball fields. Um, and I can't remember exactly, there's, there's something around 12,000 maybe over the next couple years in maintenance. Um, I love supporting the ball fields, but again, I think that that is a group that needs to think about how they can contribute um, to support. Well, have we been getting income from the teams? We get income from the, t the softball teams, but I think there are other teams that use those fields that don't pay to use the fields. And, you know, folks have talked about even like, you know, every game having, you know, a can and just saying, hey, support the ball fields. You know, I think it's great to improve the dugouts and do those kinds of things, but, um, you know, some of these... And, and I will contrast it with the library, all right? I think our support of the library makes a lot of sense because it is a community-wide asset. But even with the library, they are, you know, supporting basically 50-50, right, with right. those with improvements. So, um, so anyway, so those are two things that have been reflected in this budget, and I think we should start by earmarking and expecting some revenue and support, and then we will see what happens over this next year um, with some of those things. So those were my uh, budget recommendations, I guess. So, um, so what should we, so we got a few ones to tackle, I think. Um, so of the non-controversial, you think everybody's on board, I mean, you want to make a motion on the ones that you've recommended and you kind of can all shake our head? Uh, <laughs> sure. I think, that's a good, I think that's a good start. So I talked about the uh, legal services budget, the electric fund, and um, the uh, John Bryan Community Pottery in the ball field. Um, so uh, can I get a motion to support those recommendations? Second. 
Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. I'm no. not sure if that was the real motion. <laughs> yeah. All right. So I'll, I'll, I was the first. I was the first. How about okay. That? Okay. But I felt like there wasn't um, a sense of where we would end up in terms of the. Le oh, oh, I'm sorry. I was thinking about that. Okay. Go over. Right. Legal fund. And, oh, field. Uh, John Bryan Community yeah. Pottery and the electric. But again, what we got was that just that we're recommending to move to reduce the uh, surplus but, and move it to capital. But we're going to be conservative in doing that, knowing that we want to keep enough in operation. So if something unexpected happens, it's there because once it's in capital, it's not coming right. back. Right. Right. So the motion, the motion isn't for a specific amount. Because I, I we're think, pending input from Johnny Burns. Exactly. Right. So, we, I, I mean, I think it's direction to <laughs> do those with the final budget that mm -hmm. we get at the next meeting. Yes. So I have a quick question, yes. too, because prior to this, I heard all three of the enterprise funds moving the a little bit of surplus over capital, to the capital. Capital. Excess capital. Excess. I love that you're doing that. I mean, I and, think and that's great. And it's in this. So am yeah. I taking it back out or we're <laughs> putting, I, when you say electric, are you saying electric water? I mean, that sewer? was the one that I thought was, you know, most. It has the most, usually yes. talk about love in terms well, of. Well, but that, that's a way to get people excited. <laughs> you know, so we I, love I, utilities. I change the tone. Um, but I think, I, unless we disagree, that there's consensus around this right-sizing our budget. So I, I think it's a good thing to do with any recommendations about, you know, okay. emergencies. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. That's good. Um, okay. So then, shall we talk about the housing? Are we voting on that first one? Are we? This yeah, you a head shake. It was a head shake. Okay. Yeah, head shake, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we're good. Um, okay. Well, we're sleepy and we're just... <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. we're not sleepy. Only you, Kevin. Yeah, that's right. So, I'm not sleepy. Okay, so we're talking about housing people. and um, I will just uh, comment that I think it's a good idea for us to still move forward with an affordable housing budget line. Um, and, and I even saw in your proposal, Mary Ann, that, that you indicated that, I think you said you were supportive of that. So I guess I, but I, so I, I want to move forward with that, but then we also have to talk about the other you know, specifics. But I guess to me, establishing the budget line is a good thing to do because there's a legal process and then we can always figure out later if we're appropriating funds to that budget line. I second that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So all those in favor of a affordable budget line? <coughs> yes. Affordable housing. I, I'm, affordable I'm abstaining. Okay. I, don't, I don't think we're actually ready to do that. Okay. No. And I'd rather wait until we've decided exactly how that will be used. I think it's more important to say we're going to put money into an affordable housing project. Yeah. Well, I still I, have to counter I, each other. Yeah, right. I, no, no, I, no, I, I will say that you can, other, but you can establish the line and not put any funds into yeah. it. But then yeah, a line is there when you're ready to put something yeah. into it. Okay. So. I'm still going to abstain because I, I think it would be better to wait until we've really <clears throat> worked out the details. So, but I'm not certainly not going to vote against it. That's why I'm, I'm abstaining. Okay. So it sounds like we're going to move forward with that. So we um, have, that was a Four, yeah, I have okay. four and abstaining. So then, um, okay, so we have the request for 20000 for um, the surveying that needs to be done to get the glass farm uh, ready for uh, developing housing. Um, I certainly support that. I don't know if we... And there was a fund, a specific fund named from which to take that, right? You can take it from professional services, either in my professional services line or the council's professional right. services now line. Now it's it listed under incentives, I think, isn't it? <clears throat> the glass farm wasn't listed at all. Why don't somebody? Yeah, incentives. it is. The eighty-one thousand dollars. It's that's, that's in the so economic that's development fund. Economic yeah. development. But it wasn't specific for the glass farm. That was just the balance of the. Oh, but the I fund understood you were available. saying it would come from that fund. Uh, I think Brian actually said that. Or no, that was planning commission. Oh, okay. Well, so okay. What's well, I apologize. If so where should it come from? Oh, well, it was my understanding that the fifth that would come from the fifty thousand that was being moved out from the green space fund. That would part of that would be used for this would go, purpose. Would go into professional services. It could yes. I mean, if yes, at this point you can go ahead and put it into the professional services line, and 
Colleen can make a note in the appropriations that it's earmarked for that. And we don't have to decide which professional services, matter. whether it's council or manager? It'll be, it'll it, be, it, you know, it's, it's simpler just to put it in mind if you ask me because mm -hmm. I can make the yeah. appropriation. Yeah, especially mm -hmm. since you're going to be make the doing purchase the order. hiring of the... Okay. And, and I'm fine with where it. it comes from. I mean, I, you know, I do think that if we're doing any amount of affordable housing, it can come out of an affordable housing fund, but I don't think we need to quibble about that. So I think that's good. And, um, that, and what, what amount was that? that 20,000. 20, All right. Glass farm. So, Colleen, that goes into my professional services. Okay. So, so a motion vote on that, or is that a general, we're all good? We yeah, I think we're all good. And, you know, keeping in mind that we will be voting on the budget, you know, we'll see it all mm -hmm. at our next two meetings, right? So a lot of this is just kind of direction for what we want to see in that final document. Um, okay, so now we've got the uh, request to um, support the Glen Cottages program uh, in the, uh, project. Um, I think one thing to highlight is, and it was made clear in the letter, is that it's important um, for leveraging funds to get a commitment as soon as possible for 2020, not just 2019, but you know, it's, it's looking at those two years. So I, I think that's just to clarify. It occurs to me that if we're, um, you know, the request resonates that the way to deliver on that is to think about both years. So um, any discussion about that? Why don't we make this a motion and kind of do more and more? I'm just thinking we should take a vote. How can, if we need to have any further conversation? If there's any so have a motion and a second and then yeah, the discussion. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. All right, so I'll entertain a okay, motion. Okay, I'll, I'll move that we um, reserve 30000 uh, in the 2019 budget and 30000 in the 2000, and commit to 2000 in the 2000, excuse me, and commit to 30000 in the 2020 budget for the Glen Cottage development. Okay, is there a second? Second. Okay. Um, any discussion? Lisa? Um, I have a, um, some comments, but first I just have a question um, that's kind of an, an accounting question maybe. So um, if we establish the affordable housing line item and then we move a certain amount of money into that, if, if, could this money be allocated in that and that way we know that we already have the budget there if we make a, a commitment to monies in 2020. Mm -hmm. How does that work in our budget to do this year and next year allocation of budget? If it's a new fund, I can't put it in this budget. It won't make the time frame by the time we get approval back, get mm -hmm. the legislation, get approval back mm -hmm. from the auditors. It will go in as a supplemental I for see. next year. Mm -hmm. If it's just a line item in an already established fund, if it qualifies underneath the economic development fund, as an example, or a general fund, then yes, we can put that amount in. And again, if that's not established by the end of this budget, we can add that to 2019. And then it just carries over then unallocated for 2020? No, mm -hmm. we, we resubmit for 2020. You just have to remember that you want to put that in again. We only appropriate what we're going to spend in the current year. Well, I'm assuming we have to give a letter to the applicant <coughs> saying there's a commitment for the bill. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to understand. Yeah. How and then that do we make that next budget? We just, How do we, we make, just make that right? commitment now and then they use that in their application and then next year it's we made it. I would just like to point out to council, um, I understand this is a very important discussion and affordable housing is, is very important. I caution you as tight as the budget is this year and as tight as the budget is projected to be next year, that is something that you really need to think about when you're making a two-year commitment. Okay, it's, it's, it's going to be even tighter next year than it is this year. So you just need to be very aware of that when you're making this commitment. This is a lot of money. I'm not saying you shouldn't do it. I'm not saying you should do it. I'm just pointing out to you how tight the budget is. 
I guess I want to comment that it's, it's taken me, I know, a little time to get up to speed in understanding the economic development uh, uh, impact of this kind of development. It is going to help us pay uh, for the, you know, the services and the infrastructure improvements we need to, so I think if, if the village has to flex in terms of its plans, you know, relative to that tight budget, in order to take advantage of these opportunities, that's what the village should be thinking about. <laughs> Obviously, you can't stretch too thin to do that, but I think um, this has to be a very high, pri high, high priority. And it's, it's, it's sort of very, you know, it's like, I'm not saying anybody's doing this, but we don't want to be penny wise and pound foolish, uh, and we need to, think about and so I just think it's really important to take advantage of these opportunities it's taken me a while to really understand it all um, but the kind of monies that home Inc has been able to bring into the village with this um, with, the, with the village making clear its commitment and it's it's putting making this a, you know that the village is willing to put money you know uh, to these uh, projects I mean to not take advantage of that, I think, would be a, a huge mistake. Uh, well, I agree, and I think that was very well said. And I think uh, when we consider our goals um, and, and, and the whole uh, swath of things that we say we want to do and um, consider housing alone, um, th there's a continuum of things that we could do. Um, you know, and I guess, you know, there's some folks who, you know, have issues. We shouldn't do so much for homing. Well, it's not really about homing. It's about us. It's about the village, it's about council, and are we willing to do something uh, to help realize our goals? Um, you know, if Bob the Builder was offering something, maybe we'd give him the money. But, um, you know, so, you know, we don't have, uh, as was said earlier, we don't have multiple uh, community development corporations doing the kind of things that, that Home Inc. is doing. We don't have multiple uh, developers doing the kind of things that Home Inc. is doing. So, again, it's just about us and what we want to do uh, for the residents and for our future. And um, uh, we would like to think of uh, Home Inc. as one of the many partners that we'll have in trying to realize those goals. Yeah, I've, I've also been very influenced by discussions with community members and differentiating between this word donations versus a partnership action. I don't see that our council or the village is going to be able to move within the next couple of years on any kind of other <coughs> a project. I mean, I, I, I think that it was one of our, it's one of our key values. It was certainly something that was really important to me when I considered coming on council. And, you know, I, I have been very focused on utilities for some reason. <laughs> I don't know how that happened to me, but <laughs> I have become passionate about utilities. And, you know, so I realize this has been one of the most difficult times for me personally on council because I'm realizing the interaction of all this very complicated elements of the budget and particularly on what's underneath our streets and that we have a lot of work to do and it's going to cost a lot of money and if we don't invest in that it will be our whole village that will suffer as a result so originally I was very very concerned about this um, request and really thought that instead we had to focus um, more on this very tight budget but after a lot of consideration and conversations um, and also getting really clear on what project it is we're talking about um, because I think there is confusion in the community between the different Home Inc. projects that are being discussed and for which project, you know, are we talking about right now. So after a lot of, a lot of consideration, I, I think it's very important that we, that we support this on our budget uh, because I think it's the only momentum that we have right now to develop more affordable housing in the village. Um, what I want to emphasize that's really important to me about this kind of decision is formalizing this partnership. And I know that work is being done on that. And it's, it's very important to me that we understand that Holmink is not a special interest 
It's not, you know, one of the many nonprofits that we're, you know, just making a choice to support, but that Home Inc. is providing capacity to the village. And, uh, you know, so I guess tied to my decision on this, because um, we will make the decision in our next two meetings, is that we are making real progress towards formalizing that partnership. So that we really are, that Home Inc. is an NGO. All right, and, and that is something that we really value. We've seen that, you know, with the partnership we have with the Chamber, with Tecumseh Land Trust, and so I want to make sure that we move out of the special interest zone and into understanding that there's there's a real partnership here to move forward these goals. So, um, all right. So I think uh, sounds like we're ready to take a vote on this. Um, all those in favor of including this in the budget, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, I don't hear any opposed. Um, okay, so then the, is the last thing talking about the? Professional services. Okay, yes, police. thank so, you. And then the planning um, commission, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I move that we set aside 30K for 2019 for potential professional services to do an assessment of uh, the Yellow Springs Police Department. Okay, is there a second? I second that. Okay, any discussion? Yeah, I, I'd like to speak to it. I mean, you know, we've heard in this council meeting and we've heard other places about the issue of trust or more like lack of trust that some portions of our community have with the police department. And we, and the Justice System Task Force has been working on this, the Police Department has been working on this, and I'm not sure how much has changed, nor do I think it can change overnight. But I think one of the things that I would want to see out of some outside consulting uh, group would be help with looking at what are the kind of things what are the changes that could be made that could create a better relationship between the police and the, particularly the parts of our population, young people, people of color, what, whomever the, the groups are that uh, experience both a lack of trust and a sense that they're being victimized by the police. Um, how that how we can shift that and I think having an outside uh, someone from the outside perhaps could help with that Judith um, uh, last time I was pretty skeptical of this all, as you know <laughs> but um, I've come to, and I, I'm thinking it partly came out of a conversation uh, Lisa and I have had with Vaughn Crandall who's Beth Crandall uh, who lives here in town her son grew up in Yellow Springs he uh, works with a, an organization that works with police departments out in California. He's quite knowledgeable, very helpful. We've had conversations on the phone. He's given a lot to the village, his time and, and expertise. Um, so I think this makes some kind of sense. I think there's a, uh, but I, I, I do want to say, because we've, at, we've said the new commission will be doing a look back and we want to kind of, so I, I'm just not sure this year it would be gotten to is kind of my feeling. There's, there's a fair amount of sort of making sure the things we already did, that we have the measuring tools to know if it's doing what we want to be doing. So I guess I, I would feel, you know, open to including this as long as it doesn't give us a sense of urgency if we're not really ready. Um, Actually, I feel the same way about the prosecutor yeah. funnies. Um, I, I, yeah. I, so that so that so that if, if we don't get to it this year, that there's no sense that we have to, because I think we we want to solidify the progress we've made. I would um, agree. I and totally so that's, agree. That's my only caution. So if you speak to that, I mean, there was no date on this. Yeah. But okay. if it's not in the budget, it's not in the budget. Um, and I part of my thinking about the strong support for the commission for accelerating the um, citizen advisory and for bringing this. These are my signs 
to the council that we cannot wait and and so we need to work with a sense of urgency if we don't get to it this year okay but I I think that the events of this meeting tonight support my claim that we we must move with a sense of urgency around this issue of community police trust the cost of policing what the product that we're getting for that cost I think there's a sense of urgency so that's why I brought it okay um, yeah I I'm not gonna oppose keeping it in the budget but you know I guess I do want to flag that we can always when things come up we can always add them to the budget right so we're not we're not uh, restricted from doing that um, but it's very clear that spending any money on consulting we have to look at very carefully which is going to relate to my recommendation with the village manager search which we'll get to in a minute so uh any other comments okay all those in favor signify by saying aye aye aye, aye. thank you okay last thing i think is uh where we're taking the comp plan uh, money from so I had mentioned that I recommend that it comes out of the Economic Development Fund. Um, are there any other thoughts with that? So that's going to be 30000 out of 81000 Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that fund has been sitting there for since I've been on council. Mm -hmm. So I think it makes sense to use it to tee that up. Um, okay. Uh, so I'll make a motion to uh, take that out of the uh, Economic Development Fund. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Susan, and I'm sorry, you wanted to say something about affordable. Have no, we covered I it? Just say it when you come to that area. Okay, so we kind of did. So do you. Do you <laughs> I may or may not have anything to say because I'm going to pretty much be supporting what you need. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, okay, anything else? about uh, Emily you wanted to make a comment yes okay come on up all right Colleen thank you for amazing work on yes, this thank, thank you Colleen thank you yes. I know we have run you put you through the ringer yes. and uh, and and this is how you know that somebody's gonna stick so, thank you Colleen she's gonna be pretty hard to scare off but you can go home now you, yes you've had a long day yeah. I'm Emily Seibel, um, Executive Director of Yellow Springs Home Inc. And I wanted to say thank you, but also um, I know it's not gonna be in the budget for next year, but uh, we are a member of the Ohio Community Development Finance Fund and they issue pre-development grants. And so one of the things um, we've already uh, committed to as an organization is seeing if we can help the village get some funds to do some of that civil engineering on the glass farm. So we'll yeah. be approaching you about that cool. next year thanks Emily. thank you, thank you. okay uh, anything else before we move into old business all right and we're gonna get through these items uh, pretty quickly I think uh, Lisa you want to just do a, a real quick update on the uh, designated community improvement Corporation? sure and let me talk while I scan to that out of this Excel so uh, this is the first time we've talked for a little bit about um, the designated um, Community Investment Corporation, also known as a DCIC. Um, it's a type of, of nonprofit that um, can help us with um, a collaborative um, strategic planning among important entities um, in the community and um, support economic uh, development in Yellow Springs. Um, we've been uh, very focused on the possibility that the DCIC can be a coordinating and planning entity that could fund and oversight projects that ensure economic and cultural vitality of the village, both businesses, uh, nonprofits, uh, residential and infrastructure development. Um, we uh, have had in the past month month and a half a series of conversations with um, potential membership this included uh, the township um, the Chamber of Commerce the college um, the Yellow Springs Community Foundation 
Uh, we still haven't had a conversation um, with the schools, but we intend to, and this has been on their radar because we have uh, ex officio representation of someone from the school board in the um, Economic Sustainability Commission. So this is not something that's a surprise to anybody. Um, in addition to those stakeholders, um, we're also imagining that there would be four at-large members from business and nonprofit organizations um, that support the economic and community development or bring some sort of skills and expertise to bear on the success of the corporation. Um, we've talked about some possible tasks for the Yellow Springs DCIC. First and foremost, we understand that this would help us with our revolving loan fund. Um, it's needed a, a home, and so that would be certainly a first step for the DCIC. Um, we could also think about investing in infrastructure projects, um, providing assistance to advance uh, civic economic and community development of Yellow Springs, helping to fund residential and commercial development. Um, we've talked about a land bank. Uh, DCICs are able to apply for grants, so that would uh, uh, be a good uh, mechanism as well. Um, where we are now, um, our hope is that even though December is a really busy month uh, for everybody, we hope to convene a meeting of the potential DCIC members to have a group conversation about the work that the DCIC might do um, and have some joint ideas. We've been having, um, Brian and I have been having one-on-one -on -one meetings with the different stakeholders. It's all been received very positively. We know that when we bring this group together, um, there's an opportunity for ideas that maybe we haven't thought of and synergies. And so that's why this is really such an important opportunity for the village. Um, and we've heard from the community, you know, when this um, recent history when uh, we've had these multiple levies, you know, for the water plant and then the fire station and then the school levy and then the utilities all went up and it's like, oh my gosh, oh, right? And, and the community, we heard from the community about this. And, what we know is that everybody, these entities all have assets, um, but if everyone is just in their own silo rolling along, we're not going to be able to optimize what we can do for the community and the village as much as if we came together around a table for joint strategic planning. This doesn't mean that the village or any of the other participants would have to act the way, that, would have to do something that the DCIC told them to do. But it creates an opportunity to bring ideas, bring timelines, talk about them, talk about how they fit together, and the potential impact on the community, good or bad. So our goal is to try to get the group together in December, and at the same time move very quickly on filing the 501c3 application because it isn't until that happens that we're formally a DCIC and can begin to um, complete transactions and do business. So we're moving um, as quickly as possible and um, I, I'm sure Brian has something to add, uh, perhaps more articulate than I am, but I'm really excited about the opportunity to coordinate and collaborate um, more broadly across these important entities in the village. Yeah, I think you uh, articulated it very well. I'll just emphasize again that we look at this as a resource, again, adding capacity to move forward with economic development, to do a better job, provide a forum of coordinating a lot of these things, to basically think about how we can support our community as a whole. And um, I think the other thing I want to emphasize is that the village has teed this up but we want this to be genuinely collaborative. So the purpose and how this group morphs is something that we want to be a part of, but we want to let that uh, happen in the way that it should so that all those stakeholders are, uh, have a lot of buy-in because at the end of the day, if everybody's not bringing their A game, this is not gonna affect change. So that is critical mm -hmm. to us. 
One, one more thing I want to say. Um, if you look at the material in the packet, you'll see that we're starting to accumulate vision and mission statements in, in the back of the, of the document. And that's because we're interested in understanding the alignments of mission, vision, and values for all of the stakeholders and to focus on areas where we have agreement and try to optimize on those. So that's why we're carrying um, those in the back of the document as an appendix, in case you're wondering why those are there. Okay. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, I have a question. Kevin? Um, so, yes, I agree. You were very articulate. <laughs> I have questions about membership. Uh, first of all, do you actually have named members from each of the entities? And secondly, how, from what I've read, uh, I think the idea of not less than two-fifths uh, being elected officials is a pretty stringent requirement. Has to be a minimum um, of 40%. Right, minimum of 40%. So when you go to 11 people and you only have four... Um, it's, a, it's a minimum. So you can have more elected officials than 40%. I think what you're less. saying is you're going to have to. You're going to have to have more than four oh. people. You'll have to have more than four elected officials. No, we're thinking about if we've got four electeds, and we, seven. Need a, we need a body of 10. Yeah. Right, seven. 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 okay. So right, but 11 then puts us more than that, right? Now, 11 means less. you don't have enough elected officials. 40% well, is a person. minimum. So, so, minimum. so if there was 11, there would have to be five. Right. Okay, five. then you're going to have less than 40%. Not if you don't make five people. So as, as it is described right now, well, you can I'm only sure go to you can figure it out. All right. yeah. so we promise to figure it out. Yeah. We'll be legal. Mm -hmm. um, All right. Yeah, and, but to your first question, no, we do not have named people. I mean, we, th we think that it's important that the entities, as Kevin, um, sorry, Brian said, you know, bring, bring their A game. Mm -hmm. um, but that's going to be up to the participants. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because we're not, we're not in, in charge, you know. We're a, an ent a part of the collective. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Um, village manager search. So I, uh, there's a document on the table. I will just highlight a few things and see if there are any questions. Um, uh, Judy shared with all of council members the five uh, responses we got to our request for qualification. Um, after sitting down and talking with Patty and Judy in depth, um, I am not convinced that that will be money well spent for what we're looking for. So what I've embodied in this outline is uh, what I think we do need support with. And uh, I got assurances from Patty and Judy that other things could be handled by uh, the village team. So one thing I think we need help with is graphic design to finalize our, you know, sort of position statement and, you know, uh, things about the community. Um, and I think we should use a local graphic designer to do that. We have several that would uh, do a great job. The second thing we thought we needed some capacity on. Excuse me, excuse me. And who would decide who would do that? Should we, would we have? Um, I think it's within Patty's budget, so. Um, it it better be. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It yeah. Be. I mean, we're. I, so I we think. We just, well, no, yeah. I, mean, I mean, it's budgeted for under council's budget. I, I dropped. Right. You, right. I think you've already said okay to those funds, so yeah. and that can move. Yeah. To Patty's budget. And, well, it, well, I'll just spend it out of your line. I do that anyway. <laughs> um, uh, I just want to make clear that um, I did say that village staff can handle a lot of these things but that other things may have to wait i just want to be clear that the plates are full we'll, right we'll, well, ma we'll make it happen okay so well what you'll see if you look at this outline is most of it falls on council shoulders which was kind of reflected by some of the divvying up of, mm -hmm. of thing, tasks um so the other thing that uh we realized that we need support on is um doing background checks uh one of the things that we've learned from the past is a good social media uh, check is important mm -hmm. and so we thought that would be you know something that we could you know again contract specifically to have somebody support doing that um as we get to uh you know the finalists 
a more, you know, uh, I guess in-depth background check would certainly make sense. But um, if you look at this, most of it under my recommendation is I think about council vetting the applicants that we get and making our own decisions about who should be those finalists. And I, I partly say that from you know, going through uh, the prior village manager search where the result was great, but the finalists that we got overall, um, maybe we missed some gems that we should have been considering. And it was Lori Askland that highlighted that council really needs to be involved in looking at you know, uh, what, what we want out of those candidates. So, um, so those are my like, overall thoughts just about consultant. If, if people have different thoughts, you know, please raise those. And then otherwise, this is a timeline that uh, gets us where I think it would rep that Patty recommended to mm -hmm. make sure that we have enough time for them to give notice and do their onboarding. Mm -hmm. Judith? Um, the deadline for applications in the next, uh, you know, on February 11th, first round of reviewing applicants by council to narrow the pool. You can't narrow the pool without already getting some significant, you know, getting uh, good information about the candidates, about how they function in prior jobs. Um, it needs to be not from just their own, you know, application and their people that they give as references. It's got to go deeper than that, and to me, we will need help with that. Um, well, I, I know in my case that two council members called some of my former council members yeah. and spoke directly to them. Okay. So I was going to say, before people start narrowing the pool, you need that information. I mean, uh, so, uh, but to, so you're saying the council did it? I, I know Mary Ann made some calls. I think Brian made okay. some calls. Well, it's just, well. yeah, I mean, nobody, uh, you need that before you can think about narrowing your pool, for sure. Well, I think, you know, that, that's a fair comment, which is some of the process still needs to be refined, okay. you know, when we assign those tasks. That's, that's um, but, you know, we know that we need to get the notice out soon. Right. right. So before narrowing the pool, <laughs> broadening the pool. Yes. Is, is my concern Indeed. in terms of reaching out to making sure that we reach out to diverse communities. Uh, and I think as the uh, RFP suggested, uh, non-traditional uh, applicants. So um, I don't know if we need help with that or if we have access to appropriate resources to ensure that we're being effective in that effort. We think we have a pretty good start, um, but one of the things I mentioned with the week of January 7th, is that's a good time for us to assess if we need to step it up. So I think with all of this, you know, we need to be monitoring the process to think about is there more that we could do. So for example, an idea was mentioned, should we make a video to uh, promote this position, which I'm open to thinking about, <laughs> all right? Um, and in oh, fact, somebody, time. there's not time to do a good and, video. And somebody suggested that we should uh, get one of our famous uh, residents yep. to boost it, which uh, well, may be more than we want. Yeah. Anyway. So, but anyway, so I think. Are you that, watching out there? We <laughs> need you. <laughs> um, but I think, yeah, this definitely, we've got to be, you know, evaluating <laughs> along the way. Um, but I, I am personally not convinced that investing 15000 or more for a full-on consultant, which is what we got back, is going to get us mm -hmm. what we want. Mm -hmm. so. So, so this is a pretty rough outline, as far as I'm concerned. And I, I'd like to at least dig a little deeper <clears throat> into the first two things. So who is finalizing the position in the community? Who is doing that first step? I think, was that assigned to Lisa and I? So I did not pull out the document where we assign these tasks. <sighs> do, you um, know, do you know what? Has, has any done? work been done on it? Nope. <laughs> but, but we've got. Well, that's I mean, not true. I mean, you we've got a great statement from the last yeah. time. Yeah. So that's all so about the village. Some, but some background. Sure. Material. I mean, you saw all those from. materials from the last search. Okay, I just, so, so who then, the, the, again, so you and Lisa are going to? I believe, you? weren't we assigned to do the marketing, Lisa? Was that the? Oh, yes, we did talk about that. Okay. We did. It's I a mean, lot so to accomplish by December 3rd. 
um, obviously, but I think that the first two, um, in terms of timeline, if we can get together and get a little bit more granular, um, it seems to me that okay. the call for community committee members, some of the some of the talking points and messaging would do double service. So yeah, we did talk about that. Mm -hmm. I have total confidence that they do it. <laughs> I mean, I will say if. You know, uh, Jerry knows this because we worked together. We had a citizen committee that worked for weeks on that community statement. Mm -hmm. So I doubt we're going to be able to add a lot more to that. Um, and the position, I know we've got some new things that we're thinking about. That's why I particularly thought about December 3rd, because I thought we should have a draft to talk about at council um, to make yeah, sure we're on the same. Yes. So, yeah, I, I, I would say that this And what about the position posting? I mean, who's going to do that? Where is it going to be posted? Who's going to figure all that out? So Ruth Ann, Judy, Patty have been working on that. They've got a, a running list. Mm -hmm. We have some list. input, too, from mm -hmm. citizens mm -hmm. that with some expertise that have made some recommendations. Um, then if that could be sent to me so I that think I, could, I've, we, I sent it yeah. in the way back. You have it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I, I would also maybe rec suggest, in the same way that you reached out at the last during the last search to citizens to serve on the committee, that maybe the same outreach say, contact <coughs> Patty or me if you have good suggestions about where to reach out. For example, Antioch College okay. alumni list. Mm -hmm. all, you know, just sort of suggestions that we might not come up with that we can uh, gather. Well, I was going to say, I had a chat with Kevin McGruder in the last few days about, you know, the diversity hiring practices that we're trying to pull together and, you know, that whole issue of where, you know, where we're reaching out and getting the notices out and stuff. And so, I mean, Kevin had some particular suggestions. Um, in this instance, you know, we had to think about where the, the most relevant places would be, but keeping that also in the mix, not, you know. Okay. Yeah. All right. Great. So. You want to hear from the new candidates, Bradley? Yes, we do. Uh, okay. Steam. And I will just. Uh, well, I will say also this is a great uh, test of your uh, <laughs> yes. ability to remain articulate uh, <laughs> through many complex uh, issues. Well, and this has been a particularly yes. heavy. Meeting. Yeah. And Don't so, be discouraged. Yeah. <laughs> They're always like this. <laughs> yes. They're not um, always like. Well, this. can I? Yes. Get clarification before you do that. Is there going to be a motion to keep Judith on for another month mm -hmm. or not? Because that is a serious consideration as these people come up and give their presentations, whether that's going to occur or not occur. Just want to get clarity on that first because you um, had suggested it after uh, the budget discussion. Right. Well, we had said we were going to put it under new business. I'm okay with moving it up to now. I don't necessarily think it makes a difference. Um, do you still want to? Okay, uh, so that, I'd like to have a brief discussion with council about that. I think I stated that I've, I'm reticent to have a new person come on council after the hours we spent on the budget to vote on the budget, one. Two, I'm, I don't exactly, it feels odd to say, well, we don't want you to vote on it. Those are the two reasons that I thought it made sense for Judith to stay on while we finalize the budget. So I'd like to hear what the other well, council thinks. Well, well, certainly I can appreciate the value of Judith staying around for that. Um, it is also possible um, because whoever that new person is going to be is listening to us now. <laughs> and um, they should have the idea <laughs> that they might not be expected to have a full grasp uh, of the budget and can certainly consider abstaining, um, but duly noted. One of, I mean, one of the things that I've been paying attention to um, is, is which of the candidates for council seem to be really tracking, you know, coming to meetings. And of course, we can't tell if people watch the videos, um, but, you know, running alongside is part of being a viable candidate for me and the readiness to jump in. So that it is really complicated. 
Um, when you first brought it up earlier, I thought, wow, that's a good idea, but then now that we've resolved so many, I think, of those big questions about the budget, I, I'm not sure that we have a lot of anything controversial hanging out there anymore. So, so the two of you are comfortable having someone come on and... I think so. And you? Um, I, I don't have a strong feeling um, because I do, I do agree that that new person is going to respect uh, you know the process that we've gone through so um, so yeah uh, okay. okay let's move on okay I won't push back. Won't great um, okay <laughs> so <laughs> all right uh, I just want to say a the few champagne th pops <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> wow. um, all right so first of all I do want to say um, Judith I'm gonna miss you a ton but I know that you're still gonna be in the mix um, Judith and I uh, before we started working together on council, had some issues to work through, and, and we did that successfully. And um, it's really going to be hard to fill uh, Judith's spot. Um, but I will segue into saying I'm very impressed with all six applicants that have come forward. And I want to emphasize that you know we've got a couple that are already on commissions and involved in uh, local government. I hope that anybody else that's not selected will uh, choose to do the same. And uh, I, I think the other thing I, I want to clarify, because I made a point of clarifying with Diane, I did not say that the person had to be young <laughs> to fill this position. I said we had an opportunity to engage younger folks that feel disenfranchised, but that does not mean it has to be a young person. So I just want to be clear that I would never say something like that because I'm always listening to everything. So my decision is not biased in that way at all, but I do want to make it clear that we've got some opportunities here. So with that, the way we're going to do this is Judy is going to randomly select names. Randomly. Um, and uh, we have asked everyone to uh, make a statement for three minutes. Um, we will have a few other items to finish up before we go into executive session where we do not make a decision. We just have a discussion and we will come back out and announce our decision. Uh, people do not need to wait around for that, but you are welcome to. And we will, um, we will be expedient, but we will also make sure that we are careful about our decision. So, Judy. All right. Random shuffling of papers is occurring. You can't see it, but I swear it's really they're all, they're all wadded up, actually, <laughs> in little balls. Dan Rice. All right. Dan. How are you guys doing tonight? Uh, long, I think you need a uh, meeting already. Oh, uh, bring the mic up to your mouth. Yeah, well. there you Shall go. Shall I adjust? Is that better? Yeah. Is We've been right? hearing a lot of feedback from people who listen mm -hmm. uh, that it's you hard can, to hear us uh, and people. The, oh, um, yeah, then he has to hold it. Yeah, yeah juggling act. That's I better. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm um, starting you now, Dan. Am I starting now? Is yeah, starting? you're starting. Okay. Um, yeah, I know you guys wanted us to keep this fairly brief. Uh, um, my name's Dan Reyes, and as you've already heard, uh, I was thinking just to say a couple of things that maybe have already been included, but uh, about myself, and then a briefly a couple of things about uh, current and ongoing priorities as I see them with council to maybe characterize uh, my interest. And uh, briefly with myself, I, I think there's something useful in my background as a uh, college educator, and I work with a variety of different constituencies, uh, uh, teaching primarily with the University of Dayton these days. I've also worked with Antioch College and Antioch University, uh, but also, um, I mean, both uh, younger people and then professional uh, communities as well. And, and beyond that, in my teaching, I focus quite a bit on um, the, I would say, social, political, and ethical dimensions of the idea of community, and uh, doing some of that closer to practice, which is what I see the council doing, is attractive to me. Uh, another, I think, relevant part of my background is in architecture and planning. Uh, before coming uh, to the village, before um, getting involved in higher education, I was a practicing architect, and I, I think understanding the urban infrastructure is uh, often an important backstory to decisions that the council is faced with 
uh, making or weighing in on. So I, I think that's maybe a useful contribution. And then finally, uh, I've tried to stay active with the civic uh, community in the village while I've been here and have been, uh, uh, I, I suppose when I can, I, I've come to village meetings. When I haven't, I've tried to follow the packets and the information that's on the table. Uh, and I have participated in committees uh, ranging from design advisory, which was very open-ended, to uh, Board of Zoning Appeals, which is one of the more structured uh, occasions for uh, committees. So I, I think I have some insight to the village. Uh, besides that, though, I, I should start talking faster, I'm ga gathering <laughs> from uh, the, the look. Um, I, I was thinking uh, uh, in terms of these ongoing uh, concerns with the village, I would identify uh, guiding and incentivizing uh, both ecological stewardship and smart growth as a, a kind of regular recurring uh, occasion for, uh, for the village. And, and to do that in some ways, I mean, sometimes that's direct, sometimes probably maybe even more often it's indirect. Uh, but uh, trying to do that in a, in a way that makes sense with our resources. I know you guys are talking a lot about budget, which is a reality resource, uh, but also the goals of the community, the benefits that are going to come back to this community. Uh, I think it's also the, the justice system conversation, which is another long conversation, uh, has been an interesting one. I, I guess I was attracted to something, just a little episode in that, that Ellis was introducing over the last couple of meetings, which I thought saw as a um, legislative inspiration of sorts. The, um, the, the, uh, or the, the, the rules about um, surveillance and his remarks about other communities already noticing before it's become uh, law. Uh, but then the next challenge is administrative, right? That's an ongoing one. And I think that's the nature of justice and trust in a community. Uh, and then finally, the thing that uh, is on the table um, coming up real soon is the, uh, the personnel things that the village council does and the vet manager transition. And I, uh, I would hope that I could be a, a smart participant with that as well. Uh, drawing on some background about understanding at least parts of the job. I don't understand everything that Patty does, but um, or a manager does. But uh, how a village works, I do understand some of that. Uh, so is that uh, was that little ringing thing yeah, my that time? Was yeah, that was <laughs> All right. Everybody uh, Thanks, Dan. tries to ignore that. Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right. Next, next up. random selection is Gerald Sims. You can tell me when I can oh, go right ahead. start. <clears throat> First of all, I, you know, I, I think it's a privilege when uh, one uh, comes forward and does community service. And uh, having been there and done that, uh, it, it's hard work. But it's the work that five people decided that they wanted to do and the community elected those five. In this particular case, the five of you are going to elect that person to fill that seat. And yes, I would like to be that person. But if not, I will continue doing what I'm doing, serving on the uh, Economic Sustainability Committee. I also. Uh, I was very active in church, and one of the things that I'm proud that we did is we uh, teamed with another organization to provide a free clinic for the residents here in Yellow Springs. I'm probably the oldest candidate. Uh, that may be good and that may be bad, but I still also understand the process that we have to go through. And one of the most important ones is picking a village manager. Uh, and I have worked on picking a couple, some good, some bad. <laughs> what are you looking at me for when you say that, Jerry? <laughs> but it, but it, 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 it's, a, it's a process. And being on council is a 24-7 job. And uh, you've got to be willing to put the time in and you have to have that time to put in. I'm completely retired. I have that time. And if, if I'm picked up by you, you five, uh, you will know that you'll get my full attention 
and my energy. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Jerry. Next up is Dino Pilata. Before I begin, I just want to say a couple things. Judith, I apologize for what took place earlier, and I thank you for your service that you've done for us. We appreciate it. Um, I'm Dino Pilata. I'm a member of the Utility Resolution, uh, Resolution Board. I was a member of the Economic Sustainability Commission and the Community Resources, who assisted in getting the CBE land back in the village's hands, which eventually led to the development of Cresco. People have asked me, why are you willing to do this? In the 20 years of business, I believe there's a value of having a local business person represented on our council. I believe a blend of business people along with residents would better round out our council in the decision-making process. Furthermore, I want to give back to the community that's given to me for 20 years. Here are the four issues that I wish to discuss that tie into the major issue. My major issue is affordability and affordable housing with respect to developing new tax revenues for our village. First, number one, raising property taxes. This is the path of least resistance and does not make the community affordable, although it does give us a revenue stream. Utilities, number two, electric, water, and sewer. Our capital improvement funds were neglected and they haven't been funded for many years. We kicked the can down the road for those years and now we're all paying the higher utilities in hopes of fully funding that, that fund, those funds. By doing this, we can now pay for improvements, but this, not, this does not leave us in an affordable position in the village at this moment. Three, infrastructure. Our infrastructure is in need of repairs and updates. And even as we talk about infilling and the proposed 54 unit complex, our infrastructure needs to be addressed or you're only going to put more stress on it. This was demonstrated last week by the ice storm. Uh, for example, the south side, they lost power again and continually have electrical outages. Furthermore, the south side does have some problems regarding sewer and water runoff from heavy rains, causing sewers to back up in some homes. It's hard to imagine building houses and complexes before addressing our current infrastructure needs first. Four, business. We have to have more of a blend of business and residential in our village. This is why Cresco is such a great first step to developing new tax revenue dollars for us. Cresco is going to generate approximately $125,000 per year for the schools in the village. That's almost three times the amount that's going to be coming out of the proposed 54 unit complex. And furthermore, Cresco is going to generate another $21,000 to $33,000 in payroll taxes, as stated from reports from our, uh, our former uh, our finance director. As of major importance, that's a major importance that we look at, is living here and working here. This increases our village payroll tax dollars. If you live here but you work outside the village, we never see those payroll tax dollars. My point being out of all this is this is just one new business that's here. These are significant real tax dollars. If we can expand business on the CBE or elsewhere, we could have a positive revenue stream. We wouldn't have to run tight deficit spending budgets that we're talking about tonight. These monies would undoubtedly aid affordability for all of us and along with helping affordable housing and also give the village a bit more freedom to spend monies of their choice, which you guys were talking about earlier. It takes margin to have a mission. Again, it's a matter of blending business and residential as opposed to being one dimensional. You can't get to affordability and affordable housing without meeting these four critical steps in order to have more monies available. Perfect. I see my time's up. <laughs> I'm a viable and qualified candidate. I want this position, but I will say one last thing. When it comes to budget, when it comes to everything that you mentioned about bringing somebody up to speed, Marianne, you brought it up. Jerry Sims is probably the best person that's going to fill that need right now and, and hit the ground running. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thanks, Dino. Oh, that's me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry to keep you waiting. Um, it's crumpled really good, and we have Jeanette of Sanford. <clears throat> Hello. I have been engaged in government workings from a young age, but I have been especially inspired the last few years. This last election cycle has been even more inspiring as our Congress has more women than ever, especially young women of color. This is a historical time um, leading more people of all walks of life to serve their communities, and I'm one of those people. 
I truly believe in and value serving in the community, which is why I chose to live and serve here in Yellow Springs. I also chose Yellow Springs because of its ongoing legacy and commitment to issues of social justice. Through my studies and working experience through service, I have learned about the tenets of social justice and the steps society should take in order to make our communities fair and equitable for all. Affordability, especially in facets like housing and other necessities, is an issue of social justice. Affordability and the lack thereof is due largely to systems of injustice that are perpetuated by biases, especially in regards to the implicit biases we all carry. The goals of the Village Council regarding affordability and justice are wholly intertwined. And viewing them through that lens gives us a better understanding of our next steps and strategizing the ways in which we will work toward achieving those goals. I want to be able to empower underserved and underrepresented groups in our community and to ensure that everyone has a seat at the table. I want to be an access point for people who currently do not have interest to this process. Many view people who do not take part in this process as lazy, indifferent, or apathetic, but too often people are discouraged by their inability to connect because of barriers that are often unknown to people who do not have that experience. I've been, engaged, I've been an engaged citizen from a young age, volunteering in 2008 to call people to go out and vote before I was even old enough to vote myself. While this has always been a value of mine, I understand why people, especially young people, feel like their involvement and their votes don't matter. I believe we have the ability to change that course for our young people here, and I have the ability to make that connection as someone who has worked in that process in the classroom with young adults. This is an invaluable piece of democracy that, must, that we must prioritize at all levels of government starting locally. I believe that we as a village have a unique edge to be able to empower our community members and make their voices heard on a local level that does not often happen at the state or federal level. We must start here to give our people the tools they need to empower themselves and others. I want to be a conduit for this important work and I hope you consider me for the seat. Thank you. Thanks, Kaneta. Next up, Leo Brandon. I don't think I've been this nervous to speak publicly since sixth grade, but <laughs> <laughs> there's that. Um, can I start? Oh, yes. yes. Oh, OK, cool. <laughs> so besides my receding hairline, I know I look youthful, but I'm not going to let my Oh, sorry. Let you laugh. Um, <laughs> but I'm not going to let my age define my experience. In my five short years of being in the village, I have worked for seven different companies, um, some under the same brand. So Antioch, the Wellness Center, the Glen, Young's Jersey Dairy, Mills Park Hotel, Ertl Publishing, and your own public access. Through my experience, I have met many mentors. Um, and through those mentors, I have met, but I have heard about both good and bad ways of doing business in this town. I'm going to tell you two stories. The first story comes from a company that I've had connections with. And it's a story all too familiar to this village. This company is actually moving down the street to Xenia in the coming months. And with that being said, this this is a story that has been said for over probably 20 years. Since I filmed community councils, it was still said that, that, gov uh, sorry, that jobs were leaving this town. It's really important for us to have a live, play, and work community. With that being said, I'm going to move to my second story. At the, the, while certain industries are leaving this town, there are certain industries that are booming, the tourist industry. I work at the Mills Park Hotel as the event coordinator there, and we see hundreds of people come for weddings of all types. There is a good part of that. They invest money in the main street area and in the main businesses. They keep our tourist industry alive. However, the downside is they just invest in the main streets. I talked to an independent business owner that said it was hard to run his business because he's so far out of the loop and the infrastructure is just not there for people to reach him off one of the other streets. Along with that was my time was, uh, sorry, along with that is building affordable housing. While there is a lot of work in this town right now, it's mostly restaurant work. 
We need to be able to live here if we work in the restaurant industry. I myself have lived in the rest, I have worked in the restaurant industry and I lived in this town and it was hard to find good housing. That is a problem. We want to attract young families that are working outside of this town as well because otherwise we're just not going to see the tax revenue that we need to have a budget. Another thing that I wanted to bring up is that when I worked in the White House in DC as an intern, there was a mission to reach all constituents. No constituent had a bad idea, no constituent had a bad, um, had a bad say. It was all about making sure no one that was disenfranchised dealt it and making sure that they were into the system, making sure that the president got those responses out to those people. And at a local level, we need to do that too. So put a constituent that isn't at the table at the table. Thank you. Thanks, Leo. Yeah. All right. And I believe uh, Andrew. Let me draw my name. So I had like a 72 slide. Could you pull the thing? I'm almost tall enough I to know, do this I know. job. All right. I'm, I had a. I'm right there with you. Uh, I don't know, like probably an hour long speech. I had to try to like, you know, <laughs> cut it down to a small piece of paper. Um, but my name is Andrea Carr and I know that everyone has read my letter and read Diane's story about us in the newspaper. Um, and I'm going to try not to be exceptionally redundant here. Um, but um, I've been a yellow, uh, resident of Yellow Springs since 1989. I moved here the summer before fourth grade. Um, most recently, my family and I moved back to the village in February of 2017. Um, my husband and I are both graduates from Yellow Springs High School. Um, our parents live in this community. Um, our children attend school at Mills Lawn. There's three of them. Um, and my husband's the teacher um, in the district as well. Um, we work out at the Wellness Center. <laughs> you, we, we support local business and, you know, simply put, um, we and I are just deeply invested in Yellow Springs. So, um, while I have personal goals for the Village Council, I believe that the priorities of the Council at this time um, are affordability as well as affordable housing, and those two are not mutually exclusive, um, policing concerns, and the search for the next Village Manager. And ironically, I could have given the speech at the beginning of the meeting and just gone ahead and laid out the agenda. <laughs> so, um, I've seen Yellow Springs through many different lenses. I was a child growing up here, a young adult struggling to afford to live here, um, and now a parent to three children in this community. I believe this gives me a unique perspective and voice on the council. Um, affordability, housing needs, and drawing and retaining families and young people, as well as business and industry, are priorities to keep Yellow Springs sustainable for the long term. While affordability is not a new issue in the village, I believe we have better tools and options available to us now. The results of the housing needs assessment highlight the extraordinary housing shortage in this village, especially with respect to affordable rental homes. It is my hope for future plans um, that housing includes dedicated units for our civil servants. The disconnect currently between the police department and the needs of villagers is a concern that simply cannot be ignored. This has been a hot topic for a while, um, but recently specifically, with a lot of discussion um, within the community. I've heard constituents voice a desire for a residency requirement for our peace officers, and I'm interested in what this looks like. Is it an incentive, stipend, pay increase that allows our officers to afford to live within our village, um, or available housing? weapon restrictions for new officers, and a recommitment to a community policing that focuses on the unique needs of the village and the desires of our residents. The Justice System Task Force is a great start, but an outside assessment as well as a citizen review board are the logical next steps for improving this relationship. As a nurse midwife in the state of Ohio, I'm gonna take Dan Reyes's <laughs> um, I re um, am required to work collaboratively with physicians and have a full and clear understanding of my role and the limitations that are defined by law. Uh, I use communication, professionalism, time management, evaluation, and evidence, and in the moment, critical decision making to ensure the best outcomes. I believe the most important aspect of my profession is being an advocate for women and families that I serve, and although I have no experience in local government. My profession has prepared me with a skill set that will serve me well in Village Council. 
there are so many qualified candidates, and I was really excited to see that when the first email came out. Um, regardless of our differences and what we view as the priorities of this council, I believe in my heart that we all want what's very best for Yellow Springs. I was drawn to this process by a belief that Yellow Springs needs progressive, interactive, passionate, enthusiastic, forward thinkers, um, representatives of young families to represent the citizens of the village. I'm hopeful for the opportunity to serve this community, the one I've lived in and loved for many years. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah. All right, and thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you. Wow, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, so we have a couple of new business items and then we'll uh, move through the rest of the agenda. Um, affordable housing we've already talked about. Um, Marianne, I think you're up next with the uh, welcoming community resolution. Yes. Um, at our last uh, council meeting, Pat Deweese came with this, the request that we strengthen the uh, resolution that we had passed a year ago, I think. And since then, uh, Patty Bates has done some research and created a draft which is in our packet. There, there are two points that I was concerned about. One uh, involved how we title this. Should we title it Sanctuary Village or leave it as it is? That was one concern. The second, which is something that is still I think needs a bit more research is the issues of um, that are within the this current document uh, that say things like law abiding citizen doesn't have a warrant for arrest uh, I know that when I went to a workshop uh, presented a couple weeks ago that the Quakers presented it uh, and the pastor from Columbus was there he said that most undocumented immigrants get caught on a traffic violation. So I think I, I would, first of all, we're not voting on this tonight. This is just a, a, just a, a sample resolution. My sense at this point is one that we not call it a sanctuary village resolution. I've talked with, or I've gotten feedback from people who are working in this field in Washington, D.C., who said that is a good idea. I also, I'll just say, talked with Kevin uh, Magruder at Antioch about the process Antioch used to decide about calling Antioch a sanctuary college. And from the conversation I had with Kevin, I would concur with something that Judy Kintner actually brought up. I guess maybe a I don't agenda, agenda, plan. agenda plan or anything that calling Yellow Springs is very small. If we were to call ourselves a sanctuary village, that could in fact raise a flag not only for the college, which has that concern, but for people in the village uh, who might be being sheltered here or or living here. So it's my sense. Uh, that we not use that term. I mean, I think that anyone who's here will know what we stand for, but I do think that I'd like to do a little more investigating in terms of the language, if there are some ways we want to shift some of the language in here to acknowledge that, yeah, if someone has a serious felony charge, then there's more likelihood of uh, not, um, sheltering that person, but if someone like has a traffic violation or something, we wouldn't necessarily want our police officers to like give them up because of that. Well, so. yeah, we wouldn't be asking the question. I think the whole point of what I intended for, for the resolution was to, to show that we would not be asking that question. Um, and so the only, if, if the warrant came up, because it were entered into the system, they, it would have to be relatively serious to begin with. Um, so um, if someone got stopped for a traffic violation, they would not be asked immigration status, nor would they be, you know, anything unusual done just 
you know, if, if the warrant's entered in the system when you run their driver's license and it comes up, that's one thing. But it would not be a conscious search for that information. But isn't it, if, if, if immigration, if you're, uh, you know, an undocumented immigrant, isn't the main problem is that you do not have a license, a driver's license? I'm going to say that I don't think that's necessarily the case and leave it at that. <laughs> um, I, I, I would just like to spend I mean, a little I, more yeah, time I think that's a good idea. Yeah. I mean, I'm looking at some at of that, the language. To that mm -hmm. I agree. Come back to council. Okay, so one, and one thought I had was in section one, it occurred to me that maybe we should be also adding political beliefs or affiliations. Mm -hmm. um, where it says, being targeted on the basis of religion, nationality. Well, really, I think maybe we should say uh, citizenship. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what they're being targeted, citizenship or lack thereof. Okay. That's what they're being targeted on. Mm -hmm. um, and then, Chris, when this is uh, revised, um, I'm gonna wanna hear from you uh, about what our exposure potentially would be but we don't have to talk about that today and, sure. and I could send whatever I end up submitting to council send it to Chris beforehand mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, Patty and I have talked about this and we're in, we're in a good place to continue the conversation excellent okay, okay good and I just want to get again reiterate that I'm really happy that's come coming back I think stronger language is appropriate and I think the village should take a stand on this. So, um, anything else? No, I, I don't have anything else. Okay. Um, okay, so the two items I added just real quickly, one of them is uh, about evaluations. Uh, so Kevin, I just wanna ask you, are you willing to work with me to kind of uh, update our evaluations and kind of talk about that process and get it ready for the next meeting? Yes. Thank you. Um, so we'll come back with that. Um, and then uh, related to the revolving loan fund, um, we have had some recent inquiries about microloans and I wanted to see if council had the appetite to um, be the uh, reviewing body for you know, the village value piece of this. Uh, so that we don't have to wait until the um, designated community improvement corporation is up and running. Um, one thing I thought about it is it might not be a bad idea for us to see the process in action just so we understand it. Um, so if we are willing and assuming that the credit union is still, still willing to do the financial piece, uh, would council be open to kind of putting out there that we would entertain some revolving loan fund applicants? Okay, awesome. All right, that's what I had. Manager's report. Um, just a couple of so things. I'm sorry, to... I, I'm having a tape delay there. So yes. that the only thing that I'm concerned about is that um, I, I'm very passionate about the revolving loan fund helping to seed the DCIC. Yes. So I, we have no idea what the pent up demand is for right. loans, right? So we could presumably receive a volume that consumes the entire revolving loan fund just like that. So that takes it out of funding the initial DCIC and that being a conversation point for the convened group. So I, I don't think we can make this decision right now, but I don't know if we would want to um, set aside only a portion of our entire funding for the DCIC and also potentially set a cap for the loan request for this purpose so that we retain that fund. Right. Well, and I think, you know, we had talked about, you know, looking at loans of like maximum 5,000 or, you know, in that range before. Um, but yeah. So I, I'm just I'm, wondering about a person. I just don't want to consume the entire revolving loan fund mm -hmm. necessarily at this point, given the way it's been a focus for the DCIC. So perhaps a percentage of it or okay I think that's great so what, what would you propose? I, um, what's in the fund actually um, Colleen put 40,000 in there in the current 
How about 10? 10? Okay. Sure. Cool. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do want to say, you know, I, I hate to miss opportunities to do something that would make a difference for the village. And well, we'll, we'll have the DCIC by January, February, yeah. right? We're moving right. very fast. Yep. So I think it's good if we try it, but I just don't want to have have it just go away like that. Okay. Okay. I think that's a great point. I mean, I don't know what other people think, though. Cool. Yeah, and I really just want to pilot it. Okay. Um, so that sounds great. Thanks. Um, thank you. I mean, if there's an something that comes in that's awesome, I think we could revisit that. But okay. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Manager's report. Um, just a couple of things. Um, I was asked at the last meeting to address a comment about the. Um, the tasing incident on October 13th um, and the three discharges that show in the report um, from the taser company. Uh, there are, in fact, three triggers that show. Two of them were um, con contact triggers with the suspect that had no effect on him because he was wearing such bulky clothing because it was a chilly day. Um, the third one was an arc test because there had been no <laughs> apparent response. So the third trigger was an arc test. They show us triggers the same as a contact. Um, this, was a, this was a direct contact attempt. It, the the uh, probes were removed. It wasn't a typical shoot. It was a contact. Um, two of them were contacts uh, that had no effect because of the clothing. The third was an arc test. It was not a third contact with the suspect. So I want to be very clear about that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, um, um, that's good. Mm -hmm. um, but to me, that doesn't address the underlying point that, I mean, it, it did no harm mm -hmm. in this case, but it still happened. Mm -hmm. And that it didn't have any effect was just a coincidental thing. So I'm not sure. I mean, I think that's, I appreciate the report. But I'm not sure that that addresses the concerns of the community about the use of the taser, the discharge of the taser. The, the taser was still used in the compliance with the policy, in the policy that was passed by the council. So um, I guess the question is, you know, it's, and, and I know Chief had in his report, and I really appreciated it, this kind of uh, scenario based, you know, kind of looking mm -hmm, at scenarios. Mm -hmm, which so we've already these started. things were discharged none of it actually affected the person, and then something happened, which I assume maybe, you know, uh, that, that, you know, whatever the out-of-control behavior that was trying to be controlled, uh, mm -hmm. you know, there might be something to learn there, that's for sure, mm -hmm. that maybe yeah. could preclude next time needing to. Yeah, yeah the, the, the chief was the first officer on the scene, and he tried as many de-escalation de yes. attempts as he could. Right. Uh, the suspect was threatening to blow up the building, to harm others, to harm himself. Um, so it seems like an opportunity to yeah. you know, look at, you know, maybe if it's something that happened afterwards where the person calmed down or mm -hmm. whatever happened, something happened, they stopped trying to tase him. So. They they got him handcuffed and put into a cruiser. Um, and then since you, Judith mentioned the scenario-based training, mm -hmm. um, I'd like to get a report out on what um, the scenarios are and, um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm really excited that this is happening. Mm -hmm. So, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think it would be nice just to kind of follow up on mm -hmm. what is happening specifically. Okay. Um, uh, the other, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I just want to say, I, I, we have tasers for to be used in certain situations. Mm -hmm. And um, I am assuming uh, that that was a situation <coughs> that was appropriate. I mean, I think mm -hmm. that there was danger and uh, to residents of, and staff, I guess, mm -hmm. and that person was not complying. Right, so to me, that's the, that's the focus, not that it just, didn't work right. because no, of the thickness of the clothing. Right. That, but, but that's, that's the, what I was asked to address I see. At, at the last meeting because a, a citizen had brought up that there were three discharges and mm -hmm. I was asked and why to were there address three? why there were three discharges when the report said two. I, oh, and the third was the test. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So um, the only other thing that um, 
I'm going to bring up specifically is uh, the, the fact that we're going to uh, let the RFP for the farm leases again um, because we have to maintain those properties and there's no forward movement on them. We need to get some cover crops on them. Um, I will have, I, did I put the draft in? I did not. I will have a draft in, but I, the draft, the RFP specifically notes that um, there will be minimal use of pesticides, that organic pesticides will be used whenever possible, that anything that goes on there has to be approved ahead of time, and that council will get a report out at the end of the year on that. So. And why do we have to say minimal as opposed to no? Um, because there, are, there will be instances where they have to use something to control um, problems with the crop, but the, they will be required to use organic pesticides whenever they are available. I mean, this, we're not requiring people to do an organic farming, and even if we were, you have to have three years in order to be certified to do organic. So that would be, I think, over the top for us. Do we, is there something we want to do, though, relative to the fact that Glass Farm will eventually, I mean, maybe it's we're a little far out yet. It is, because 2019, we'll be getting the mm -hmm. test results. 2020, we'll be yeah. planning it. That's my assumption. Yeah. I, be, I can't imagine anything would happen before 2021. And, and we'll let them for one-year intervals with possible one-year renewals, and all of them will be let to one farmer, because before we had two and there was another one that was interested, so we're going to let all of the properties to one. So in the RFP, could we request their, I guess, plant management plan mm -hmm. so that we can at least see what they're proposing with, you know, pesticides mm -hmm. or lack thereof? Mm -hmm. okay. And that's all I had in my report. And I just wanted to raise, since it was also brought up about the uh, Brazos, Mm -hmm. Are we looking into what some communities do where they just have those automatic, like, you know, uh, I don't know what you call them, but they, if you speed, you get a, you know, something in the mail that says this doesn't put points on your record, but you have to pay a fine for speeding? Have we? Are we it's been, oh, there's, speed, it? there's speed cameras. Right. They, they've been challenged. The, the issue with that is that the, the current status of the law, is, uh, as I understand it, is, is that if, if that's done, you, you can do it, but you have to have an officer there to witness it. Mm. So it, it, it's become a, it is not a cost-effective measure right. okay. for many communities. Because um, I, I know Dayton's doing it, for example, and I just wondered. I need to look into it again to see how they've evolved it, but when the, 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 the courts ruled they essentially took away the automated part of it, which is why it was a cost-effective tool, okay. uh, depending on your point of view, for traffic safety or revenue <laughs> generation. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. And I guess I just wanted to bring it up because I'm not thinking about it for revenue generation, but given limited capacity, I mean, that could be a way to control speeders that come in, you know, through our gateways, particularly Dayton Street, that's been problematic. So we don't have to get into it, but I just wanted to see if we'd ever looked at that. Um, okay. Uh, Chris, anything else? Not for me. Okay. Judy? Uh, you've got it in writing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, board and commission reports, anything that council members would like to highlight? Yeah. I'd like to go ahead and do <laughs> Mark Ewald. Uh, nominate him oh, for uh, Energy Board. He's been on before. He's left town for a while. Now he's back. Uh, Judith and I met with him. We're all all on board. I think it would be a great member yeah. to get back to what he's done before. So I would like to nominate him for that uh, position. Great. Awesome. Okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. And I just went off. Oh. I was just going to say that Judy is going to reach out to Mark about when he actually should. Yeah. Come I, thought for already, yeah. I thought we'd already not. Uh, yeah. I just want to point out that uh, energy, uh, Patty had asked me to talk to the energy board about their activities um, we're just going to be reviewing with them. Um, you know, basically asking them that, you know, because staff is so busy, council is so busy, that any things that they do not add work uh, overflows. 
and um, that they be thinking about the whole question of capacity. Right. And um, so they're going to have a conversation about that. Good. I, I have two things I'd like to highlight. Uh, the Housing Advisory Board would like to give uh, an end of the year report and goals for next year and request for council to affirm its its uh, mission and membership and we'd like to do that either the first or second meeting in December it's on for the second meeting on the agenda oh good okay great and also Planning Commission has lost Rose Pelzel who's now working for the village and that means there are only four Planning Commission members mm -hmm. and Planning Commission is really important at this time. It's going to be mm -hmm. continuing to be important. Uh, and I really would like to expedite getting someone and, and anyone who has a background in housing, planning, community development, any kind of uh, skill or experience that's related to Planning Commission. It would be great to get someone with more, who has that experience. Right, and I believe we also have a second alternate spot that could be filled as well mm -hmm. so that we don't get in a pinch. So, so has that gone out, Judy? Oh, yeah, yeah, it's been out, and you have two candidates oh. waiting for the vote tonight because waiting. one of them is both things. One of these people in the, who have applied for counsel. Okay, got it. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, one, one thing I want to raise on that is there's been this conversation about you know, commissions not being political bodies, and I think uh, it depends on what you mean by political. I suppose they're not they're not a, they're not elected persons, but I do think we need to be thinking about and sharing when we're talking with people the goals of the village around you know housing and issues to do with planning. Um, we don't want to be in town, you know, because those kind of value judgments uh, come into play when you're on planning commission and. It's on what we want to have, you know, diverse views, but we don't want to be working against ourselves uh, between mm -hmm. uh, and the and village council. And I don't really actually agree that anything's not political. We're watching Supreme Court uh, appointments. You know, yes, they're judicial, but in fact, there's, you know, the way people interpret professionals have different points of view. And so I just wanted mm -hmm. people who are going to be doing this interview. Thanks, Judith. Lisa? I have two things quickly. Uh, first, Economic Sustainability Commission. Um, we've been working actively um, to focus on attraction and marketing strategy for the land currently known as the um, Center for Business and Education. And uh, if you're interested in that, we've been working on a SWOT analysis. So uh, maybe look at, take a look at the uh, packet. Um, I'd welcome your input. It's interesting and important work in terms of economic growth and the tax base. Um, Art and Culture Commission, um, you may have noticed that the Jungle Mural um, has been in the process of restoration, so please save the date for December 12th at 5 p.m. when there'll be a ribbon cutting and some celebration. Um, and uh, the Banner Project, I also want to mention um, that is being led by uh, one of the teachers at uh, Mills Lawn. Uh, I, I want to say that I kind of misspoke. Uh, the focus is on um, historic women in, who have been involved with Yellow Springs, not just women in general. So if you have ideas of, of women from Yellow Springs who have a connection to Yellow Springs to be featured in that banner project, let me know. And I just want to add about December 12th um, that we will be uh, having that ribbon cutting dedication for the uh, jungle mural uh, at the Emporium. So we're going to have hot drinks and holiday cookies. And we're also going to be dedicating the Village Inspiration and Design Award uh, to the muralists of Yellow Springs. So the, uh, so the Vita Award will live uh, in what has been described to me as the power strip to get you to uh, Key well, Sally. What are the times of those? Uh, five o'clock. And then Where's we're, it gonna be? Um, right at the Emporium, so it'll either, if it's oh. nice, we'll be out in the courtyard. If it's not, we'll be inside, listening to some jazz music. And uh, 
We also are encouraging people to then go to the Chamber's holiday party at 5.30 at the brewery and S&G distillery. So. And, and I'm having brain fuzz. I apologize. I realized that I said Mills Lawn for the Banner Project, and it's a high school project. Yeah. So <laughs> sorry about that. It's high school, not elementary. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Uh, future agenda items, uh, we've already identified a few things here. Um, I want to make sure that we've got the um, active transportation plan under special reports. Got it. Um, is there anything else? Report of the, uh, whatever's going to be, uh, what's oh, yes. the finalized position, community yes. description yep. for December 3rd? Say what? Uh, the uh, manager of the search. The, yeah, the posting. The posting. And then staff evals, uh, were you bringing those back or is that? What's, uh, the yeah, so we, we will talk, we'll talk about our process mm -hmm. on December 3rd. Yep. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. With the goal to finish that by the end of the year. Right. And then draft RFP for the farm lease, did you want that back? The, the it's, welcoming community. I'd like to get the RFP out. So I thought I could just make the changes, if that's okay. Yeah, okay. uh, and then, yeah, if I can look at it, that'd be great. Okay. And Brian, on the transient housing, you were thinking, uh, last meeting you said you were thinking sometime in January. Were you thinking the first or second meeting? Um, why not the first meeting? Chris? Transient If we're ready for that. Transient, transient lodging. lodging. Transient lodging. Oh, the discussion. The discussion for right. Yeah, it's okay. I thought you were talking something else. <laughs> yeah. We can push out the ESC special report. Do we want planning commission involved in this? Transient housing. No, I mean, I well, no. didn't they uh, have some recommendation a year ago that council didn't abide by, but no. at least it, it seems like we should pull it out and see. Well, I don't think they need to be here. We can certainly bring back that recommendation. It's there, it was right. in packets. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll be writing a brief um, of what's happened in the past and what's been suggested, and Chris is doing a presentation I think at the planning and zoning workshop in December which yes. is why we put it off until right yeah. and then I've got a question for you folks on December 10th Planning Commission will make a recommendation because they've got a 30-day window to do so they will make a recommendation to council regarding the PUD um, you can either put on your agenda consideration of that recommendation to be followed by um, a rezoning ordinance or you can try to wrangle with both the recommendation and a first reading of a rezoning ordinance in the same meeting no sooner than December 17th. And that is very, very fast writing of recommendations and minutes. <laughs> but we are confident that we can likely get that done. So, so one is, couldn't you say that again? I don't get the so there are, there are two things that happen. You will receive a recommendation from Planning Commission, which you can either approve, approve with recommendations, or do something different with. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you decide that you want to approve that PUD, whether or not you have any changes or recommendations to it, you have to rezone that property. So that that's what triggers kind of all the legal proceedings that follow from that point. So it, it's probably an extensive discussion. And then you can either have that around a first reading, or you can have that discussion to determine what you want to do with that recommendation, how you want to respond to that recommendation within council. It does not go back. It does not go back to planning commission. It's your decision. And then you determine whether you want to bring an ordinance, and then that ordinance has to have two readings. Well, uh, if we decide to approve with or without conditions the PUD plan, well, of course we would be rezoning, right? I mean, we would be rezoning yeah, yes. the PUD. Yeah. The, yes. the question is, do you want to go ahead and have the discussion and then read the ordinance, or do you want to have the discussion and then read the ordinance at the next meeting on the first read? Having, having the ordinance with the discussion presumes an outcome. So that is up to you as to whether you want to give the appearance of presuming an outcome or you're simply being efficient and having it at the table. 
I mean, I, I don't, I mean, I think you can look at it either way, but it's for you about how much can you take on in one meeting and then how you feel about that. I won't be there. <laughs> or I'll, be there. I'll be on over there. <laughs> but uh, All right, well, let's figure it out at the next it's, meeting. Well, it just seems like we should do it. I mean, have them both on the agenda. Right, and we still have, we're still talking about December 17th, so. Um, okay. All right. Um, okay, anything else? And did you hear me say to, you can pull out the ESC yes. special report? Yeah, got that. 17th. Okay. Uh, you want to move it to the 17th? Well, or. Let's okay. push it into January. We can decide yeah, let's push it into Second January. meeting. We got to oh, more doing it. Okay. Yeah, we have, to, we have to convene, you know, a couple more times. It's. Um, okay, uh, so with that, I'll entertain a motion to uh, move into executive session. I move that we move into executive session Second. Second. for the or purpose the of discussion of the qualifications of the council open seat candidates. Very good. That okay. Works. And do we have a second? Do you have a second? Second. Okay. Uh, Judy, can you do the roll call, please? Yes. Pausch. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Sumplin. Yes. Stokes. Yes. Krieger. Yes. Okay, and this is uh, will be a council only uh, executive session. So. Uh, I think Chris has something he wants to advise you on. Okay, so uh, Chris advises on something first. Uh, we will reconvene and we will uh, be making a nomination and decision after. Okay. Yeah. Oh we will definitely cut. But well, we will want to turn the camera. You nominate uh, Kanata Sampson. Sanford. 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 Thank you. <laughs> Sanford. Yes. Um, Second. Okay. Um, and uh, should we do a roll call? Yes. Okay. Because you, you need at least three. So Stokes. Yes. Krieger. Yes. Hempley. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Hush. Yes. Um, so I will just say briefly. Uh, yes, thank you everyone, and uh, welcome aboard, Kanetta. Um, I think one of the things that everybody knows is we took to heart um, Judith's request that we look for somebody that really um, represents her constituency, um, and I think all of you do. Uh, Kanetta, I, and I think really um, highlighted some things that resonated in particular and uh, the second piece is, uh, I, you know, I really think the engagement piece that, um, you know, with, that was talked about with, with everybody was another big factor for us and uh, making sure that we remain a diverse body um, and that those different perspectives are brought into our decisions. So uh, thanks again. Um, please talk to us if you need a recommendation for a commission. And, um, oh, council? Well, yes. Uh, yes, I would like to say that I think HRC is going to have an open position, like, right now. Um, <laughs> it, it, I don't know if it's been broadcast, advertised yet, though, right, Judah? Yeah, I think Judah? we already did. Do we? Okay. Yeah, I, it, I'll check. Okay, <laughs> but HRC, yeah, I'm looking at all of you. We <laughs> want you. Mm -hmm. Yes, and we know the Planning Commission has got a uh, full seat and an alternate position. Um, and, and I'd just like to say, you know, we, every one of you had strengths that we discussed mm -hmm. and are excited about and uh, hope to get you wrangled in one way or another, if you aren't already. All right. Yeah. Ditto. Very impressive. You guys ditto, ditto. ditto. Yeah. I wish impressive. we could have taken more than just one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So thanks again. And um, with that, I, I move we adjourn.
And I will second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All right, thank you. Epic council meeting. Uh, no, no, no. Maybe all this week because there's only three days.